Welcome to Pick 6 Movies. This is Bo. Me and my longtime friend Chad do this show where we come up with a theme and then we discuss six movies based around that theme. And we even do a cute little story on the front end about the movie or something related to the movie. Oh, jeez. This season is called We're All Gonna Die. At the time, that seemed pretty funny. Now it's more of a prophecy as it happens. Anyway, this is the finale of season 11, and we have landed on one of the most divisive movies we've ever discussed on this show, a real Michael Bay brain shrinker of an action movie. Look, keep your head on a swivel out there, people. It's the final episode of Pick 6 Movies Season 11, 1998's Armageddon. Well, it's been a long three months for us here on planet Earth, dealing with the COVID-19 virus. And if you're listening to this at the time that the episode was originally released, the United States is starting to open back up. Everyone here at Pick 6 Movies hopes you're safe and you're healthy. I'm recording this show on my mobile phone, hands-free, of course, safety first, always (laughs) safety first. I just, I need to get out of the house. You know, I've got my face mask that my wife sewed for me and I'm headed down to Home Depot to pick up some supplies to handle a little light housework and, uh, you know, take care of that honeydew list that uh, my lovely wife gave me now that we're trying to get back to this new state of normal. I always enjoy going to Home Depot to speak with Frank or Harry, especially today because I gotta get their advice on how to swap out a bathroom vanity in our downstairs half bath. We want to make it more presentable, so if company comes over, you know, stop by unexpectedly, they're inevitably gonna need to drop a Deschanel in the downstairs guest lavatory. Now, I prefer Home Depot over Lowe's, even though Lowe's is actually a little more convenient for me to get to. Even though it's right across the street from Home Depot, which always strikes me as a bit odd. You know, it's kind of strange, if you will, how Home Depots and Lowe's always seem to be built kind of on top of one another. And you know what? If you look over there, there's a McDonald's right next to a Wendy's. There's a 7-Eleven across from that BP gas and sip. There's Mattress King in the same strip mall as King Mattress. CVS and Walgreens. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Walmart Supercenter, Target Supercenter, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts. We got two nail salons, two hair salons, two Chinese food takeout joints, two predatory lending check cashing places, two tattoo parlors, two pawn shops, two methadone clinics, all clustered in the same part of town. Why are so many companies that offer the same products or services located so close together? Well, it turns out, Science has the answer. Yeah, that's right. Science. You know, the thing that 42% of Americans think is made up bullshit? Yeah, that's science. Well, science has figured out why this is for us, and they've given it a name. It's clustering. And clustering can be explained by game theory. More specifically, Hotelling's model of spatial competition. Now, I know a bunch of you are preparing to start screaming and yelling. You're going to go to Twitter or Facebook or TikTok or whatever the hell it is and try to debunk this scientific theory when I'm finished. But do me a favor. Put your poorly spelled protest signs down on the ground and keep your Bible verses in check for just a couple of minutes. Here's the deal. Businesses want to be located near the center of a customer population inside where their potential customer base is located. Now, you might think with companies offering the same products or services, it would make sense to spread them out so everybody gets their fair share of available customers. But it doesn't work that way. Why? Well, because of Nash Equilibrium. What's that, you ask? Well, stop theoretically asking questions and I'll explain it to you. 
Each business will try to find the best location to serve all of their potential customers. And Nash equilibrium occurs when all of the competitors have moved to the optimal location in terms of potential customers. Basically, for each area of population density, there are only a few, or heck, maybe even one optimal location. And the mathematics of competition will drive all competitors to this optimal location. Now, this makes sense in the capitalist free market system in which we live, but we see similar pairings of dominant products on store shelves and in our everyday lives. There's Coke and Pepsi, there's Marvel in DC, there's Ford and GM, UPS and FedEx, Hasbro, Mattel, Pizza Hut, Papa John's, Hunt's, Heinz, Ketchup, Catsup, Google, Bing. Well, maybe not Bing. This binary choice of consumer products and spatial location extends beyond consumer products and makes its way into the world of entertainment as well. Specifically, we see this over and over again in the world of movies, where two products, in this case films, identical in so many ways are thrust upon the public, whereupon we, the movie-going audience, must make the difficult choice of choosing between two movies available almost at the exact same time at the exact same place. This concept of movie twins all started back in 1934 with the release of The Rise of Catherine the Great and The Scarlet Empress, two movies which were both about, well, Catherine the Great. Now, a few years later, Betty Davis, who didn't get the role of Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind, well, she landed the role in the movie Jezebel, which was pushed into production so that Davis could play a spirited Southern belle during the Civil War. Take that, Vivian Lee! There were two Abe Lincoln movies released in 1939 and 1940. 1960 saw two movies about Oscar Wilde, one titled well, Oscar Wilde, and the other was The Trials of Oscar Wilde. In 64, we got Dr. Strangelove and Failsafe, two movies that both focused on nuclear war of the accidental type. Now, Dr. Strangelove was satire and Failsafe was a drama, but still, how much accidental nuclear annihilation do audiences need up on the silver screen? How about something a little more lighthearted for the theaters that everyone can enjoy? Something like widowed parents bringing their families together with hilarious outcomes. Well, 1968 gave us two movies based on that concept. Yours, Mine, and Ours came out alongside With Six, You Get Egg Roll. I don't know why, but that last movie's title always sounds a little bit racist to me. In 1971, we got Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song starring Marvin Van Peebles, father of Mario, and the original Shaft starring Richard Roundtree. And both of these films still vie for the title of earliest and best black exploitation movie of all time. Editorial aside, it's Shaft. In 1973, we got Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar, two movies based on musicals based on the life of Jesus Christ. In 1979, there were three Dracula movies released, Nosferatu the Vampire, directed by Werner Herzog, and there was Dracula, starring a super sexy Franklin Jella, and there was also the goofball comedy Love at First Bite, starring super tan George Hamilton as Dracula. See, that's funny because Dracula had a tan, but he can't go out in the sun. Where was I? Oh yeah, movie twins. And it wasn't just Dracula that got a triple dose of monster movie magic in one year, because in 1981, three werewolf movies landed on the big screen, including The Howling, Wolfen, and American Werewolf in London. In 1983, there were two James Bond movies released in the same year, one starring the James Bond du jour, Roger Moore, in the film Octopussy, and the second Bond film starred the original James Bond, Sean Connery, in Never Say Never Again. Guess which one of those two movies I've never seen? That's right, the one that's not called Octopussy. In 1984, filmmakers gave movie-going audiences two breakdancing movies in the spring of that year, Breakin' and Beat Street. And Breakin' was so popular that it inspired a sequel, Breakin' 2 Electric Boogaloo, that was released in theaters six short months after the original Breakin' was released. I feel it's important to point out that the producers of the Breakin' movies, two Israeli cousins, went on to each create their own movie based on the Lombada dance craze. One film titled Lombada and the other film titled The Forbidden Dance. And these movies not only competed with each other in theaters, they actually premiered on the exact same day in the spring of 1990. You know what, let's get back to the 80s. 
In 85, we got Weird Science and Real Genius and My Science Project, all movies about teenagers doing science stuff. 85 also gave us Back to the Future and Peggy Sue Got Married, about teenagers going back to the 50s to meet their parents. 86 gave us two animated mouse movies, An American Tale and The Great Mouse Detective. And between 1987 and 1988, there were four, yes, four big screen movies about young boys who find themselves inside adult man bodies. You know what? Get your mind out of the gutter. Let's see. We had Like Father, Like Son with Dudley Moore and an only slightly religious Kirk Cameron. There was Big, starring American treasure Tom Hanks, where Mr. Hanks was nominated for his first Oscar. Vice Versa starred Judge Reinhold and a precocious Fred Savage. Fred Savage won a Saturn Award for Best Performance of a Young Actor. Congratulations on whatever that achievement is. And lastly, there was a film titled 18 Again with George Burns. Although, in fairness, this movie was about an old George Burns who gets to run around in his grandson's body while his grandson lays in a comatose state in his grandfather's old body for the majority of the movie. So really, this movie is about a horny old man who finds himself inside a young boy's body. Again, get your mind out of the gutter. Now, that same year, there was also a made-for-TV movie called 14 Going on 30, where a 14-year-old boy who is infatuated with his teacher uses a growth accelerator to make himself appear older than his actual age in an attempt to seduce his teacher. You know what? You can put your mind back in the gutter on that one. I can't stop you anymore. This movie was aired on ABC and later distributed by Walt Disney Home Video. Ah, the Eisner years. 89 brought us Four underwater movies where people fought aquatic nightmares. There was James Cameron's The Abyss. There was The Evil Below, Lords of the Deep, and The Rift. In 91, we got two Robin Hood movies. Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner and a glorious mullet. And then separately, there was Robin Hood starring Patrick Bergen and Uma Thurman. Yeah, I never saw that one either. Good God, how much longer is this list? In 1992, we got not one, but two Christopher Columbus movies. The first, 1492, Conquest of Paradise, and separately, Christopher Columbus, The Discovery. You know what? Just keep moving. I didn't see either of those as well. Need a little more Hollywood history? Well, we got Tombstone in 93, and then Wyatt Earp in 94. Now, I know, these two movies weren't released the exact same year, but honestly, did we really need two Wyatt Earp movies? The answer to that is clearly a no. 94 gave us Terminal Velocity and Drop Zone, both action films that involve skydiving. That same year, we got Street Fighter and Double Dragon, martial art movies based on video games. And then this trend of twin movies started to get out of control in 97. We got two volcano disaster movies, Dante's Peak with Pierce Brosnan and Volcano with Tommy Lee Jones. The Jackal and The Assignment came out that same year. Two movies that were action thrillers where the assassin in each of the films was named The Jackal. There were two movies about the Dalai Lama, Kundun and Seven Years in Tibet. There was The House of Yes and The Myth of Fingerprints, two movies about fucked up families at Thanksgiving. You know what? Add those to that list of movies I'm never going to see as well. We got Murder at 1600 and Absolute Power, two movies about a murder investigation at the White House. Again, I didn't see either of those, but you know what? I'll bet the president has some real explaining to do. But the year of years where movie-going audiences couldn't plop their asses down in a theater seat without thinking, hey, didn't I see this movie already? Was 1998. In this glorious year, we got two movies based on the life of long-distance runner Steve Prefontaine, Without Limits, and Prefontaine. Write those movies down on the list just below those Christopher Columbus movies, because I'm never going to see those either. We got two animated movies about ants. First, the Woody Allen-Sylvester Stallone pairing in the DreamWorks animated film Ants. That's Ants with a Z. This is a movie that one reviewer called Marxist Propaganda for Kids. Now across the hallway at the local Cineplex, showing in theater number two, was Pixar's sophomore outing of Bugs Life. Both of these movies are about misfit ants who fall in love with an ant princess and leave their home and end up the movie's hero at the end. How does this even happen? 
98 gave us Saving Private Ryan and The Thin Red Line, both critically acclaimed World War II military dramas. That same year, we got Dead Man on Campus and The Curve, two movies about college students leveraging the suicide of another student to get a 4.0 for the semester in college. Little worldly advice, this is not the case. If your roommate dies by suicide, you get a trip to the police station and you have to answer a lot of really uncomfortable questions. I know, firsthand. 98 gave us two movies about disco in the 70s, including Last Days of Disco and 54, where Mike Myers tries to suck Breckenmeyer's cock. We got The Tale of the Mummy with Christopher Lee and The Mummy with Brandon Fraser. 98 gave us the brilliant and somewhat prophetic film The Truman Show, starring Jim Carrey and directed by the brilliant Peter Weir, alongside the film Ed TV with Matthew McConaughey, which was directed by the brilliant Ron Howard. And both of these movies are about a main character whose life is aired on TV 24 hours a day. But the biggest, most explosive, star-studded, action-packed battle of movies that were pretty much the exact same movie involved Earth, a giant rock hurtling through space, and a plan to save humanity that's so crazy, it just might work. The two films, of course, that I'm talking about are Mimi Leader's Deep Impact, which was followed just a few months later that same year by the subject of this very episode of Pick 6 Movies. I'm speaking of Michael Bay's apocalyptic all-American cinematic sensation, Armageddon. Deep Impact and Armageddon hit theaters within two months of each other, and it's not really fair to talk about one without talking about the other. And more importantly, we need to get a baseline understanding of just how in the heck two movies that are so alike were conceived, produced, and released at almost the exact same time. Now, according to a May 1998 issue of Starlog magazine, producers David Brown and Richard Zana came up with the concept of deep impact back in the 70s as a way to update the 1951 movie, When Worlds Collide. They took the idea to Steven Spielberg, who had the rights to Arthur C. Clarke's novel, The Hammer of God, which was about an asteroid that smacks into Earth. These two ideas were kind of mashed up together into a single script by Bruce Joel Rubin, which was then rewritten by Michael Tolkien. But neither When Worlds Collide or The Hammer of God had enough influence to be credited in the final product that would become Deep Impact. Spielberg was originally set to direct Deep Impact, but instead he decided to go helm the film Amistad. That is a very good movie, and maybe the last time you ever hear it mentioned on this particular podcast. Let's get back to Deep Impact. The DreamWorks project needed a new director, and quick. Why so quick? Well, over at Disney, another project was in the works that was a whole lot like Deep Impact. It's Armageddon. Rumor had it that the team behind Armageddon had a mole in the DreamWorks factory who was reporting on the dailies of Deep Impact and even allegedly stealing footage of the film to take back to the Armageddon camp. Can you imagine such unscrupulous behavior by Hollywood filmmakers? Mimi Leader was picked to helm Deep Impact. Now, just a year earlier, she had her directorial debut with The Peacemaker that starred George Clooney and Nicole Kidman. Now, The Peacemaker was the first movie from Steven Spielberg's newly formed DreamWorks studio, so it made sense to have Leader take the director's chair for Deep Impact. Deep Impact script was penned by the aforementioned Bruce Joel Rubin, who at the time had hits with the Demi Moore, Patrick Swayze romantic ceramics film Ghost and the Tim Robbins film Jacob's Ladder. Michael Tolkien, as noted, was also credited for the screenplay. He was the screenwriter for Deep Cover, which starred Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldblum. Note to self, see Deep Cover, that sounds bonkers. And the Robert Altman film The Player, starring none other than Tim Robbins. Hmm, that Tim Robbins had quite a career in the 90s, didn't he? Now, the plot for Deep Impact is pretty much this. A teenager, played by Elijah Wood, you know, Frodo. He's on this school field trip, and he notices something up in the night sky, and he lets some sky nerds know something's up. About a year later, a scrappy female reporter, played by Taya Leone, who is working for MSNBC, hears there's a cover-up in the president's administration, and she thinks it involves a staffer having an affair with a woman named Ellie. But it turns out the cover-up of this liberal government involves hiding the truth from the American people about a comet headed towards Earth. The impact will be an extinction-level event, ELE, -E, which is where the name Ellie comes from. 
The government, it turns out, has spent the past year devising a mission to land asteroids on the comet, plant nuclear weapons on it, and blow it up to save Earth. But the plan fails, and a huge chunk of rock is headed into Earth, specifically North America's Atlantic coast. You know, the most important part of the United States. Then the government reveals, hey, we got a backup plan that involves construction of an underground bunker, and we also have this lottery system that will decide who's going to die and which of the 800,000 U.S. citizens get to go inside the bunker and, well, not die. Oh, did I mention that anybody over the age of 50 is automatically in the you're going to die group? That happens in Deep Impact. Then guess what happens next? People naturally just lose their shit. Martial law is enacted. And the president gets really condescending to the American people on national television. In the end, a chunk of the comet hits Earth, leaving a billion people dead, but most people survive. Hooray? Did I mention that Robert Duvall and a very skinny John Favreau are among the astronauts that fly into space? No? Did I mention that Morgan Freeman plays the President of the United States? Keep in mind, this is a full decade before Barack Obama would run for that very same office. MSNBC? A black president? Death panels? With hindsight, this is the most left-leaning, blue state, half-decaf soy latte frappuccino, Bill Clinton loving what time does Frazier come on movie of the last decade in the 20th century. Now let's contrast that against the Michael Bay destruct a ganza explode a red white and blow your ass out the back of the theater film known as Armageddon. At this time Michael Bay had scored box office success with the 1995 film Bad Boys starring Will Smith and Martin Lawrence. A year later The Rock came out starring Sean Connery and Nicolas Cage. Michael Bay was on the upswing with these over the top action films that were loud and big. They were fireworks with lots of noise and exploding colors. They had simple stories and they didn't deal with complex social and political issues. They just blew shit up with guns or bombs or dynamite or cars or more guns if you have them handy. Riding duties of Armageddon went to three riders. Up first is the wonder kid himself, J.J. Abrams, and his mystery box, who at the time had written a handful of movies, including the James Belushi comedy? taking care of business. He also wrote the Harrison Ford is an asshole lawyer who loses his memory after getting shot film regarding Henry. And Abrams brought unto the world that Joe Pesci, Danny Glover classic Gone Fishing. That's right, you forgot that the guy who was selected to single-handedly reboot Star Wars wrote Gone Fishing. Up next, Tony Gilroy. Writer number two. Gilroy had adapted the Stephen King novel Dolores Claiborne for the big screen back in 95. He would later go on to write those Jason Bourne movies, and rounding out our trio was Jonathan Hensley, who wrote that third Die Hard movie, and later he'd go on to work on Jumanji, and he's involved in some way or the other with those current sequels. Now, I'm not going to get into the plot too much of Armageddon. We're going to tackle that when Bo gets here in a few minutes, but let's just say that Armageddon kicks the liberal, wimpy ass of deep impact on every conceivable level. The comet in Deep Impact is seven miles long. The asteroid in Armageddon is the size of Texas. Suck it, libs. And this asteroid is going to hit Earth, and it's going to kill everybody in about two weeks. There's no time to bullshit around for a year and build a shelter for the uppity elites of society to hide. Hell no! Armageddon just gets a bunch of blue-collar working men who like to gamble and go to strip clubs and drive Harley Davidsons and shoot guns, and they put them in a couple of space shuttles and fire them into space to blow this fucking rock out of the sky. Armageddon was bigger, louder, longer. It was more explosive, more ridiculous. It was more everything. Rumor had it that after Deep Impact was released in theaters over Memorial Day weekend, Disney Studio Chairman Joe Roth gave the team behind Armageddon an additional $3 million to go throw in more visual effects sequences to be incorporated just a few months before Armageddon was going to hit the screen over the 4th of July weekend. Now, Deep Impact had a higher opening weekend than Armageddon did, 41 million versus 36 million, but pretty quickly, Deep Impact took a backseat to Armageddon's overall box office success. And with hindsight, it's not hard to see why. Armageddon is about American exceptionalism, with a bunch of beer-drinking average Joes who are just flung up into space to blow up an asteroid, with Bruce Willis as their leader. The world was in trouble, and America was here to save the day. In Deep Impact, the government 
government and the scientists are the smartest people in the room. Over in Armageddon, it's the oil drillers who have all the hands-on practical street smart knowledge, and the scientists are just a bunch of book smart nerdlinger know-nothings. When the Armageddon scientists are pressed as to why they didn't see the asteroid coming, they say, it's a big fucking sky. See there? These overeducated dumbasses, they don't know shit. Deep Impact is about integrity and people choosing to do the right thing. As humanity faces extinction, it's complicated and it's layered. Deep Impact is set in the real world where people are flawed and they display their true humanity when it matters. Armageddon, on the other hand, is pretty much Bruce Willis leading a group of degenerates from Delta House up into outer space on a suicide mission. This was America in 1998. Everybody was kind of over having a president who got a blow job from an intern in the White House. The country was poised for George W. Bush to get elected and get the United States morality back in check with a little help of the U.S. Supreme Court. But you know what? This movie was before Y2K. It was before 9-11. America was riding high. Michael Bay made a movie that filtered every frame through a 90s era Norman Rockwell lens with children in overalls out in flyover country drinking Coca-Cola out of the bottle and waving the stars and stripes while they sat in the bleachers of a little league game. Deep Impact was more authentic and in its own way it imagined a scenario that tried to play out what if something like this were to really happen? How would we as a people, as a nation, as a planet process this on an emotional and intellectual level? Armageddon said, hey y'all, check out this shit. Now in the end, both movies were financial successes. Deep Impact pulled in about $359 million worldwide, but Armageddon crushed that total with $553 million worldwide. Having rewatched both of these movies, it's easy to argue that Deep Impact is the better film. But you know what? Armageddon, it's the better movie. That's just my opinion. But I know somebody who is eagerly wanting to look me in the eyes call me a damn fool, and admonish me for choosing Armageddon as this season's finale. You, me, we, heck, all of us. It's been a rough few months, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we're on a collision course with the end of this season, and we're running out of time. So let's get Bo in here, stick a bomb on this movie, and do our damnedest to blow it up and save the world. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, don't close your eyes, don't fall asleep because you don't want to miss a thing. As we end season 11 with 1998's Michael Bay masterpiece of mayhem, Armageddon. <laughs> oh man, Bo hates this movie. This'll be fun. And welcome to Pick 6 Movies. I am Chad Cooper, here with my stalwart, resolute, strong as nails, hard as a board, I don't know where this is going, Mr. Bo Ransdell. Bo, how are you doing as we have found ourselves at the end of season 11? We're all going to die, and yet we're still alive. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a testament to the power of the human spirit mm -hmm. that we made it through this season. I know. <laughs> I'm not excited to talk about this movie. Oh, I am. <laughs> I know you are. I'm excited because you're not excited. This is one of a handful of movies that I just refuse to watch. And I've watched a lot of shit. And in, in fact, go out of my way sometimes to see a shitty movie. I do not watch Michael Bay films. Michael Bay, Peter Berg is on that list for me of just like, what's the fucking point? I know I'm going to watch this and walk away from it angry, mm -hmm. which is what happens every time I watch one of the Michael Bay films. And it's what happened when I watched Armageddon again. That's what happens when I watch a Tim Burton movie. Yeah, I mean, Tim Burton, later Tim Burton, sure. But at least there's some early Tim Burton stuff that is kind of genius. You know, like your Ed Woods and, uh, and your Pee Wee's Big Adventures. Michael Bay has never done a movie that is not wall-to-wall -wall shit. Shame on you. Shame on you. <laughs> I stand by it. I would ra I would rather somebody just punch me in the face <laughs> rather than watch a Michael Bay movie because I will get over that pain quicker. I love Armageddon. I could watch Armageddon once a year. It is so unapologetically all-American. It has no shame. It is it is so upfront with this patriotic, star-spangled banner, America will save planet Earth. I absolutely adore just how goofy it is. I can't remember what reviewer said it. It might have been Roger Ebert's <laughs> review. 
who who shared similar views of the film as myself but somebody said watching armageddon is like somebody slapping a tin garbage can over your head and having half a dozen people bang it with golf clubs for 151 minutes <laughs> And I absolutely agree with that. It is one of the more painful experiences I've ever had. It, for all the lousy movies we've seen, I will watch all of them three times over before I ever watch this thing again. Bo, you ignorant slut. <laughs> you know, there there are movies there are movies that are made for certain people. Uh -huh. And I believe that the the antimatter of that is true. Uh -huh. Where there are certain movies that are like kryptonite for for me as a viewer. There aren't a lot of them, but pretty much everything Michael Bay has ever shat out is on that list. <laughs> Of just like, this is antithetical to everything I believe and am as a person. <laughs> It, like Frank Capra is one of those things like I when I watch a Frank Capra movie it's like listening to the music <laughs> of the spheres or something it's like I get where this comes from it has that same kind of you know like almost spiritual kind of nationalism to mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. but I can respect that because it's all about like fundamental American value and one thing <laughs> that Michael Bay excels at is America's the fucking best. I mean, but don't listen to the government or the smarty pants. There is this weird <laughs> dichotomy in his movies where it's like everything about America is great except for everyone who leads it. <laughs> I always dreamed that Michael Bay would make a Superman movie. <laughs> I mean, look, you had a Zack Snyder Superman movie, and that's right next door. No, it's not. You know, Zack Snyder Superman was all doom and gloom. Michael Bay would have just been Superman running around America, opening up hot dog stands and using his laser vision to bake apple pies. Again, if it's a choice of you can see Michael Bay's Superman Returns. Oh, God. Or, or get a punch right in the face. <laughs> I'm taking the punch every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Our movie opens with <laughs> <laughs> the desert road tracking shot punctuated by the all too familiar lightning bolt hitting a tree from the heavens. That is a insignia letting us know that we are watching a Jerry Bruckheimer film. You know, you're in for a good time, Bo. It's Bruckheimer. It's yeah. It's like in case you thought this might be a good movie. Let us remind you that Jerry Bruckheimer, he's the one pushing this movie forward. And then on the back end of that, you get a little touchstone. It's like, oh, right. Every once in a while, Disney is just like, I don't know. Let's just make the dumbest thing we can and see how that goes. We hear a pan flute, or maybe it's a regular flute, playing. And there's this very soothing melody as we gently fly through the vast darkness of space until we see the familiar landscape of the moon, which drifts aside to reveal planet Earth. And we hear the velvet voice of the man who was elected the president of the National Rifle Association in the year 1998. It was just one month before this movie's release in theaters, Bo. And I'm talking about Charlton Heston. Chuck Heston was one of the manliest men ever to walk God's green earth. It was all the chest hair. That's what did it. He was like, he was a lightweight. If you were going to put him in a boxing category, he mm -hmm. would have been a featherweight, mm -hmm. but he just had a lot of chest hair. He introduces our movie thusly when he says, this is the earth at a time when dinosaurs roamed a lush and fertile planet. A piece of rock just six miles wise changed all that. It hit with the force of 10,000 nuclear weapons, which that's a lot of nuclear weapons, Bo. A trillion tons of dirt and rock hurtled up into the atmosphere, creating a suffocating blanket of dust, which I was like, I think they're making these estimates up now. The sun was powerless to penetrate for a thousand years. It happened before, and it'll happen again. Just a question of when. Against all of this voiceover, we see this rock smack into Earth, and it just covers the globe with fire blanket of hell. And also, I just want to note, there was a hurricane happening on Earth at the same time, so insult and injury. And then the Earth just kind of consumes itself in flames in biblical fashion. And I'm thinking, I thought this was an ice age, but apparently not, because Earth just turns bright orange and yellow and black and red. And then we get the movie's title, Armageddon, in all capital letters, and the word explodes in a fireball bow this movie is making 
no excuses for everything we're about to see. Yeah, it's it's like your neighbor who comes over uninvited and just shits on your floor. I was thinking it's like your neighbor who comes over with two paper bags full of fireworks and goes, hey man, let's go fucking blow some shit up. I, in neither case am I letting that person in. You know what? You live in a different neighborhood than I do. Your neighborhood, they shit on your... To my neighborhood, we blow things up with fireworks. Well, here they shit on your porch, stick fireworks in it, and let that blow up. And that, in many ways, that kind of is Armageddon. A pile of shit stuffed with M80s. We cut to a wide shot of Earth. The title card says 65 five million years later and i just wanted to point out there was a gallup poll taken back in 2014 that showed that four in ten americans believe that god created the earth less than ten thousand years ago yeah but what do you think that 40 percent of america thought when they saw this movie and they we are now 65 million years in the future <laughs> that's just that's just hollywood bullshit in this same survey 80 percent of americans said they believe in miracles and 25 percent didn't know that the earth revolved around the sun also a large percentage didn't know that the earth core was hot and a surprising number of respondents didn't know that the father's sperm determined a baby's sex and most of them were appalled the babies were even having sex that bit, tidbit is way down on the list of surprises the one that really breaks your heart a little bit is the uh, earth traveling around the sun thing where you're like look that's that's one that we picked up as a species in what the, the 13th century like we've got a, a solid i don't know five to seven hundred years of that one being under the belt <laughs> you know what happens when you split an atom well you get an eve bo shit <laughs> Oh, Jesus. Any Bible tell you that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're on Earth and it's present day 1998. And we have some astronauts and they're up in space and they're doing a spacewalk and they're working on a satellite. And this one astronaut, he's getting a little jittery, Bo. He's all sweaty. But then back on Earth, we meet Billy Bob Thornton, who is at Mission Control. And he's the guy at NASA who's kind of in charge of everything. And Billy Bob Thornton says, hey, Hoss, how you doing, amigo? I'll give you a buffalo nickel. If you get your heart rate down a notch or two. Giddy up. He actually uses the phrase buffalo nickel. Mm -hmm. There are a number of moments where I can't stop myself from telling this movie to go fuck itself. Mm -hmm. And and having that characterization right off the bat is like, ugh, we're in for it, aren't we? Have I ever told you about the buffalo nickel that I carry around? No. Is it to calm down, Hoss? <laughs> So I was bartending and I went in and I cashed a check. And for some weird reason, the lady at the bank I went into, when she cashed a check for me, she gave me a silver dollar and it had the year of my birth on it. And I was like, well, that seems kind of weird. And so I put it in my pocket that day. Then I went to bartend and this alcoholic came in and he was sitting at the bar getting drunk the way alcoholics do. And I thought, hey, I'm going to talk to this guy about uh, what it's like being a drunk and tell him about my day-to-day -day activities. And I told him I got this coin that had the year of my birth. And this dude looked at me like I was a prophet. And he said, I have a buffalo nickel in my pocket that has the year of my birth on it. And I'm supposed to exchange it with you for that silver dollar. <laughs> And I was like, let's do this thing. So we swap coins. I put it in my pocket and I have had that Buffalo nickel with me. It's in my car right now for over 20 beers. The only way that story would be better is if the person with whom you exchanged the coins was Gary Busey. Oh yeah, that would have been great. But no, he was just some downtown drunk who was like, Hey, I, I bet I can swindle this shithead out of a dollar. But I got a good story out of it. Anyway, so. And, and a Buffalo nickel that you've held on to for 20 years. I would, I would wager to say that you've had that far longer than he had that silver dollar. Absolutely. Because he was probably dead within 18 months. And that silver dollar was in the cash register of Beanie's Liquors <laughs> within 24 hours. As he was picking up a pint of whatever <laughs> plastic bottle of vodka he could get his hands on for the night. We're back up in space and our sweaty astronaut finishes his outer space work. And then out of nowhere, Bo, space rocks just start pelting this satellite that he's working on. And Bo, one rock, it rips the sleeve of this astronaut's uniform and cuts right across, God, the American flag patch. Jeez, Chad, how do they come up with the, these subtle moments of symbolism that tug at the American heartstring? <laughs> 
And then Jesus these, Christ. <laughs> and then these projectiles, they increase in number and speed and intensity, and they just start pelting the space shuttle, which then explodes into a million pieces, and each of those pieces explode into a million pieces. We are three minutes into this movie, and we have a national tragedy unfolding right in front of our eyes. This movie is not playing around. And Billy Bob Thornton immediately is like, hey, y'all play that tape back. I, mean, I, I think i saw something a little a little hinky one guy says i think it might be a surprise missile attack do you know anything about anything what are you talking about dumbass immediately billy bob thornton is just like get me the president on the phone he's gonna need to know about this and then billy bob says look i need three groups one is this an internal malfunction maybe it's a glitch i'm like a glitch that, that, that's not gonna fly in the final report of what caused the space shuttle to blow up and then billy bob says number two i want norad space command and the 50th tactical to recheck all the space junk in orbit and so we got a glitch or space junk that's curtain number one and curtain number two what about curtain number three there billy bob and he goes group number three that's wild cards anything and everything else yeah, wait wait we got glitches which is like a oopsie yeah space junk or everything else that guy who said maybe it's a sneak missile attack was more on the ball than i initially gave him credit for well you just want one team that's kicking around the old peanut you know <laughs> that's like what if a giant space alien threw down a bunch of legos but to us they're giant size but to him because he's a giant space alien they're small legos but they're big enough to destroy a space station what if one of those uh astronauts was a, a homosexual perhaps it was the lord taking him out because the same way god uses hurricanes to kill gays in new orleans he could use space rocks to kill homosexual astronauts it's just biblical fact bo our movie cuts to a farmhouse that has this full-size observatory built in the backyard it is massive and we will find out later that it is one of nine observatories on earth capable of exploring outer space and carl the owner of this personal albeit professional grade observatory he's looking around up in space and his wife and his wife runs out of her their home and she's screaming and she kicks open the door to the observatory and she says carl carl you stofus pot pie has been on the table for almost 10 hours i want a divorce and this woman is Laura Palmer's mother from Twin Peaks for Begensies. <laughs> it's so great. Second of all, introduces us to the fact that there is not a single woman in this movie that will matter to the plot mm -mm. or be casually tossed aside by the menfolk <laughs> when things get serious. I only remembered four women in this whole movie. We'll get to poor Grace Zabriskie, <laughs> who's the, the uh, actress in, in question how she's treated in this but let's just go ahead and start the clock on all the ways this movie is offensive and <laughs> let's put misogyny on the board carl the husband says i'm onto something big here go and get my book with all the names of those nasa guys and this wife says am i wearing a sign that says i'm carl's slave and he goes go get my goddamn phone book <laughs> get brett we i said <laughs> She runs off because she knows that tone is definitely accompanied by some physical violence. I was hoping she ran inside and called a divorce law as we hear Carl screaming, Get the book! Get the book! Get the book! Right, and so then we cut to a shot of Iwo Jima in case you had <laughs> lost your erection during all the American flag shit on the space uh, station earlier. <laughs> Then Keith David drives into the movie in a motorcade. General Keith David. Yeah. And for a second, you're like, oh, yeah, Keith David's really good. Ugh. So. <laughs> but he's all business in this movie. And he right. kind of, he represents like the military establishment or the political establishment. He's the face of that. Yes. He and the president uh, are the face of that. You don't really see the president too much. You just kind of hear him. Yeah. But you see him enough that he like there's a lot of presidential speeches because somebody saw independence day uh and was like hey you know what's good when the president makes a stirring speech and he's gonna give a couple of them so once we introduce keith david because every edit in this movie is about three and a half seconds long just in case you i don't know wanted to build a scene or something the marvel movies do that every no, edit in a marvel movie is like one sixteenth of a second of like cut 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 some of the action stuff is but there's actually some memorable 
memorable and emotional scenes that happen in those films. And I'll be the first to say, like, are Marvel movies deep and satisfying entertainment? No, but they're a hell of a lot of fun. You show Armageddon to a thousand people and you can pick any Marvel movie you want by itself. You can't pick the whole, you know, sure. catalog of Hootenanny. More people are going to cry at the end of this movie than at the end of, I would say, any other Marvel movie you want to pick. Yeah, because most people are fucking stupid. Well, I know! <laughs> and, and, and are easily manipulated. I mean, it's like... The the fact that a dog doesn't fucking die in this movie is stunning to me. But anyway, so this movie is three card Monty. The con is on and you're the mark. That's what I love about it. You and I have very different emotional reactions to this movie. I do not find this to, to be like a tearjerker or heartwarming or whatever. It's just a series of, oh, fuck yous. <laughs> and, but anyway, so we cut over to New York City. Yes. Where we get the movie's requisite racism as this black homeless dude. Hold is on, talking. hold on. He's not some black homeless dude. This is Eddie Griffin, comedian of Eddie Griffin. He was undercover brother. A far superior film. Yes. And he's got uh, a pug dog named Little Richard, R.I.P. Yeah. And he's talking crazy to his dog in this. I'm going to make it in the big time, Little Richard. I'm going to be the big time. Like, and yeah. then he pauses in front of a TV store where there's a news report about the space shuttle and or station exploded up right and then little richard runs off down the street and starts chewing up the street vendors tiny godzilla dolls yeah. that he's selling out on the street corner which fun fact bo roland emmerich uh released godzilla starring matthew broderick jean reno and hank azaria in may of 1998 the year that armageddon was released so one can assume having little richard the pug attack these dolls was a real subtle dig at their summertime competition they have fun in hollywood bo yeah you can keep all of that and then <laughs> they should have had the dog hump that godzilla just bend it over and just give it a good uh, uh. that would have been funny you know when you're debating like which is better <laughs> roland emmerich's godzilla or michael bay's armageddon you can just stop making <laughs> movies just knock it off we've we've clearly surpassed <laughs> <laughs> our responsibility the street vendor is a large possibly polynesian man he kind of kicks little richard the pug away because he's chewing up his merchandise and eddie griffin comes over and says hey don't kick my dog little richard i will throw your fat pineapple eating ass through the window and i was like first off eddie griffin on your best day you might be able to throw him a surprise birthday party if you really put some effort into it you are not throwing this man through a window ever <laughs> now i'm just flashing back to the scene in undercover brother where they try to get him to eat mayonnaise <laughs> when they're trying to whiten eddie griffin up it's a great movie because yeah and dave, dave chappelle is the cue of that film it's fucking real good Th um, this meteorite crashes into the pineapple dude uh-huh then there's also like, shit starts blowing up everywhere bo it's just total bayhem See how I took Michael Bay and Mayhem and I made a little new word? Yeah. And <laughs> and if if the 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 racism was too subtle for you with Eddie Griffith being the homeless guy in the movie, let's cut to the New York City cab driver. Mark Curry, aka Mr. Cooper in the ABC sitcom, hanging with Mr. Cooper. No relation. Oh, although in this scene he's hanging with two Asian stereotypes. <laughs> Who are taking pictures and the woman is like, I want to go shopping or something. You're just like, Jesus Christ, this movie is hurting my brain for how dumb it is. <laughs> and, I love it. And then they go back to Space Command, I guess, whatever the fuck this place is. And they're like, uh, sir, there are bogeys all over the eastern seaboard. They cut back to Mark Curry, who yells, Saddam Hussein is bombing us. Do you think that Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld saw this movie and thought, say, if New York is ever attacked by anyone or anything, you know, alien space debris terrorist, we could possibly pin that on Saddam Hussein. Thank you, Mr. Curry. You know what? I think if we just wrap this shit in an American flag, people are going to buy it. That was the real lesson of this movie. And that's totally what happened. Yeah. Dick Cheney, <laughs> who I think was a smart man, or still is maybe, I don't know. He might not have gone to hell yet. And, but he probably looked at this movie and was just like, Jesus Christ, what a stupid ass piece of shit. That, what, what, how much money did it make? Say, I got an idea. 40% of the population believe that everything in the universe was created less than 10,000 years ago? 
Wait, how I many can... of them believe in angels? <laughs> no shit. Huh. Oh, werewolves? Leprechauns? Oh, shit. Man, that is... Uh, that is one of those things like when people are like, <laughs> I believe in angels. And then you're like, what about vampires? <laughs> and they're like, what? No, that's stupid. And it's like, let's not split hairs here. Both of us are b- believe in like undead creatures. I'm just leaning towards the one what sucks blood and fucks a lot too. <laughs> <laughs> so basically all of new york is getting blown up left and right by these meteorites yes. and it looks like the end of any avengers movie that's been made over the last decade and yes. i argue this looks a little better than the avengers movies because it is real cars really getting blown up left and right on what is pretending to be the city streets of new york no i'll grant you some of the practical effects when there are practical effects we quickly abandon those in the back (laughs) half of this movie but uh so yeah some of the practical effects of you know you blow up a car and it's still it's like hey you blew up a fucking car that's cool And people are screaming and running. And I just want to just sort of, you know, put some points on the board. The United States has suffered a destroyed space shuttle in outer space and a catastrophic attack from kind of the heavens on one of the most populated cities in the nation that is arguably more destructive than the attacks of 9-11. And speaking of 9-11, there's a shot of the Twin Towers in this movie where one of them is on fire and smoke is pouring out of the top of it. And it's, you know, early in the morning, the sun is coming up and whenever you see the twin towers in any movie it always kind of brings you out of the film at least for me because when you're watching you're like oh yeah that was one of the worst days in american history ever (laughs) right you know but that is still i would argue preferable to actually paying attention to the film (laughs) (laughs) to just reflect on the the needless lives lost i would rather think about the the sheer terror and agony of those people who threw themselves out of the world trade center and and what they must have thought on the way down and then then to pay attention to the film armageddon i will not argue that point with you keith david gets on on the general horn with keith billy. david he's a general man come on general keith david gets on the on the horn with billy bob thornton the whole planet is under attack it's not missiles like johnson said johnson's an idiot what is it then? The president needs to know. And Billy Bob Thornton is just like, sir, I got to tell you, we are just trying to figure out if this is the beginning or the end of this shit. And you're like, all right, I guess that is as close as we're going to get to actual writing in this film. <laughs> then Billy Bob gets on the phone with the pot pie guy. Carl. And Carl is telling him like, yeah, it's this big ass asteroid that's heading towards Earth. And hey, uh, since I discovered I get to name it, right? I want to name it Dottie after my wife. And Billy Bob Thornton is like, well, that's awful nice of you. And he goes, yeah. Because that thing is a vicious, life-sucking bitch from which there is no escape to. And Dottie's sitting across from him listening to all this, and she just gives him the finger. (laughs) Yeah, and so in the first ten, this is all first ten minutes of the movie, we've got a couple of different flavors of racism and misogyny. (laughs) And we haven't haven't ticked into the 15-minute mark, so, you know, well done, Michael Bay. We cut to the lead NASA scientist who are being led by the movie's director, Michael Bay. He's in it. And then there's this one NASA nerd and he's wearing a sweater vest and he says, uh, this is an anomaly of gargantuan proportions, creating an intergalactic anomaly of anomalous anomalies in space. And then unbeknownst to this NASA nerd, the president of the United States and other government officials are listening in on his nerd ramblings. And the president has a loudspeaker that lets him bark orders at these nasa nerds and the president says enough with this anomaly horseshit what is this thing and billy bob thornton says it's an asteroid sir and the president says how big is the asteroid is it bigger than the one from the other movie with the black president the asteroid has to be bigger and tougher and stronger than the black president's space rock so don't you worry about mr president this asteroid's the size of texas which you will easily carry in the coming election and it's going to kill everything including bacteria you hear that, boys? They love me in Texas. This asteroid is the biggest asteroid in the history ever. No administration has ever dealt with an asteroid this big. Uh, tell me, Billy Bob Thornton, um, why didn't we see this thing coming? Well, uh, Mr. President, it turns out that space is very big, and uh, we can't look at all of it. Billy Bob Thornton goes on to dumb things down to the president by sizing this up to the second largest of the 50 states. And then he refers to to outer space as the sky when he's talking about outer space and i'm like you know what all of this seems totally believable because billy bob thornton goes on to say you know 
the ones that you saw earlier today, sir, that destroyed New York City, they were the size of basketballs and Volkswagens. Me, 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 me. Why did you use Volkswagens? Me, me. Could have me, me, see, we can destroy the earth too. Me, me, me. Could have been a Toyota. Me, me, me. But it's Volkswagens. Me, me, me. Remember, Hitler made us. Me, me, me. We're back. Me, me, me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the president says, so Billy Bob Thornton, let me see if I get this straight. Somehow the state of Texas is in outer space, or as I like to call it, the sky. And Texas is shooting basketballs and Volkswagens at the U.S. of A. Important question here, will the state of Texas hit the rest of the United States that aren't up in the sky yet? And if Texas crashes into where I am, what kind of damage is that going to do? Also, question B, can we lift all the other states up into the sky and therefore avoid Texas when it hits? What if we move the entire United States to be the United States of space? I've got a space force. I'm working on that. You know what? This could be like the local cops tracking America up in space. I love this idea. Let's make it happen. (laughs) And then a dude uh, runs in like crazy through nasa or whatever and shows up and he's like we've got 18 days before this shit hits earth and they're like well goddamn, that seems like it's gonna happen pretty quick boy this movie couldn't be more than what 90 100 minutes <laughs> oh buckle up it's two and a half hours long people what it, in the ever living fuck it's so bloated and we'll get to the shit that they should have cut out i also like that all of the nasa nerds in this are just all nondescript balding white guys and if you look at the film's credits there are not one but two people in this movie credited as dr nerd <laughs> that feels right <laughs> You know what? While we're just passing the fuck yous around in this movie, let's pause and take a special moment for J.J. Abrams. Okay. As you pointed out in your introduction, Gone Fishing's J.J. Abrams. Uh Uh-huh. Who has somehow or another managed to fuck up two major franchises (laughs) and piss off people who love the one show that people are like, you know, Lost was still pretty good. I mean, not the end of it when it mattered, but the rest of it was pretty good. He's got his mystery box, Bo. J.J. Abrams is one of the most overhyped directors in modern history. And writers. Oh, writers for sure. The the one good J.J. Abrams movie I'll give you is Mission Impossible 3, and that's kind of it. What about Super 8? (laughs) Yeah, let me me tell you the moment in Super 8 where I was like, well, this is just the stupidest thing I ever saw. (laughs) Was it the moon and credits came up at the beginning? It's when they're shooting rockets at the alien or whatever, and they're like, well, it seems like the alien has given off some force field or whatnot that makes all our missiles go all higgledy piggledy and hit everything but him huh well we should probably fire some more missiles at it then see if that doesn't do the trick that was one of the top 10 dumbest things i I think i've i've seen in a a major motion picture but i know what'll make you feel better the movie cuts away and we hear zz tops lagrange sure while we see an asshole hitting golf balls into the ocean not into the ocean chad as it happens this asshole is having some fun with a greenpeace boat that is protesting drilling into the ocean i mean because what could go wrong chad I like that golf is always presented as the sport of elitist assholes in movies. You know, baseball is always the sport of well-meaning dads, and football is the sport of collective inner strength to overcome challenges, and hockey is always about misfits, soccer is about bending it like Beckham or cross-dressing boys under the watchful eye of Rodney Dangerfield, but golf is always an asshole sport in movies. I don't know how elitist it is, because this is very blue-collar. This whole movie is just like, come on, let's put on our helmets and get to work, boy. Well, it turns out our mystery golfer is Bruce Willis, and we're out in the middle of the South China Sea, and he's whacking these balls at these hippies. <laughs> yeah, at, at the hippies. Here. Again, what a bunch of dicks for protesting the oil drilling that, as we saw in later years, turned out to produce horrible ecological disasters, but what the fuck do they know? Will Patton, who we last saw in Gone in 60 Seconds. Welcome back, Mr. Patton. He is Bruce Willis's right-hand man on this drilling platform, and Will Patton comes over and says, Well, sir, I found something interesting, uh, Bruce Willis. Last night, the number two chewed 180 feet, and I'm going to give you a couple of guesses who's responsible, but uh, you're only going to need one. Yeah, and Bruce Willis is just like, what? Who did that? He's like, God damn it, Ben Affleck. And he just chunks this driver out into the ocean. And I'm like, look, man, 50 bucks says that was clearly not his golf. Like Will Patton is just like, 
Well, uh, that was that was my club, and I guess I'll just get another one next time we're on shore. It was a birthday present. Uh, my wife gave it to me when our son was born. Haven't seen him in about three or four years. Not sure I ever will, but uh, the future's funny. Not sure the way the winding road of your life is going to turn. No, I'm not going to get that golf club back, however. I mean, I sure as hell am not going to go diving for it, but I'll tell you what, let's uh, just head on up to... Uh, AJ's room and see what the fuck's happening. Bruce Willis goes up to Ben Affleck's room and they're on this drilling platform and he bursts in. Then Bruce Willis has this kind of like sad excuse for a Southern accent that he uses when he needs it in this film. And Bruce Willis comes in to this hovel of a living quarter and he's like, look, Ben Affleck, when you're all grown up and you've got your own oil company and $8 million of your own money on the contract, you can do whatever comes in to your idiot in mind of yours. And I was thinking, is Bruce Willis a millionaire in this movie? Just pretending to be a working man like those Duck Dynasty guys? I mean, it, he owns his own drilling company, so one presumes he has more money than he's letting on. <laughs> and But Ben Affleck is like, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, I promise I'll never do this again. Wait a minute, Ben Affleck. You've never apologized to me this quick. And what's this? A woman's bra? There's only one woman on this particular oil rig, and that's my daughter, Liv Tyler. Are you fucking her? Well, and then he pulls back the, the covers to reveal Liv Tyler in this bed. His daughter, as it happens. Surprise! I was just hiding under the covers. <laughs> And he's like, you get dressed. And then he looks at uh, Ben Affleck and he's like, I'm going to be right back. And then as soon as Bruce Willis leaves the room, Ben Affleck just fucking runs. Yeah, this movie intercuts scenes from the oil rig with scenes of Billy Bob Thornton talking to all the NASA nerds about the solution to the Texas asteroid problem. And then it cuts back to Bruce Willis, where he's just running around this oil rig shooting a shotgun at Ben Affleck, just blowing out windows of the office in this oil rig. And Bruce Willis says, you better make your peace with God, Ben Affleck. If I was caught fucking my boss's daughter on an isolated floating barge in the middle of the South China Sea, and he's firing live ammunition at me, talking about making your peace with God, dude, if that's happening to you, you're going to die. This man is going to kill you. He's going to throw your body in the ocean. He's going to claim it was suicide. He's going to give everybody else in the crew an extra 10 large to keep their mouth shut, and life goes on. Yeah, I don't know that he's going to spend the 10 large. I mean, everybody seems like... He's a millionaire. He can grease the skids. But everyone is only mildly protesting about this he passes steve buscemi who it turns out is in this movie he's the best part of the movie Ugh, i mean all right <laughs> and then but bruce willis is like it walks by him with a shotgun and he's like did you know about this steve buscemi is just like eh, i mean we all kind of knew and then he just starts shooting this fucking shotgun at ben uh -huh. affleck will Patton is like say there bruce willis uh you know, you promised AJ's dad you were going to take care of him before he died. And Bruce Willis is like, fuck that noise, and just starts chasing Ben Affleck around while John Coffey, I mean, uh, Michael Clark Duncan, uh -huh. like tries to give Ben Affleck a head start by just standing in the way. Hey, boss, it's me, the giant wall of a man, Michael <laughs> Clark Duncan. My name is Bear in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> because what else are you going to call a big black man when you're in an all-white writer's room? My name couldn't be Jerry or Charles. No, it's Bear. And then Bruce Willis shoots at Ben Affleck and a ricochet like sh hits him in the leg. So he gets 100% shot by Bruce Willis at this point. And then all this Second Amendment shenanigans gets interrupted because Steve Buscemi looks over and sees a helicopter landing and he's like, hey guys, pucker up. We got clients incoming. And so we just leave the ocean. We head back to NASA headquarters where Billy Bob Thornton, he's holding court with all of the top NASA nerds. And one of them says, well, what if we use a thermal laser defranculator to increase the temperature? of the projectile till it bisects the two smaller glavens and billy bob thornton ever the voice of explaining it to the dummies in the audience of this movie says look that's like shooting a freight train with a bb gun come on guys we got 18 days that's 431 hours time is a luxury we do not have i like the fact that he treats this proposal to use like mylar sales or whatever the fuck as if it is the guy proposing that they put engines on an iceberg in brewster's millions where it's just like that is just <laughs> dumb enough to spend a lot of money on and about this time the most reliable and sensible nasa nerd shows up and he's carrying 30 pounds of binders and 
random disheveled papers and he nods his head as if to say, I have an idea that's so stupid it just might work. So we cut back to the drilling platform and Liv Tyler has now thrown on a sensible black dress and she's put her hair up with this long wooden hairpin to greet the Asian investors who arrived in the helicopter that we saw earlier. And Liv Tyler and Bruce Willis, they start jabbering about whether or not Liv Tyler should be allowed to fuck Ben Affleck. And then Liv Tyler starts showing these Chinese investors around while we get more backstory to our characters. Bruce Willis's wife slash Liv Tyler's mom, she split a long time ago. We see that Liv Tyler can speak Chinese fluently. We learn that she's lived on an oil rig since she was 10 years old. We learn that Steve Buscemi taught Liv Tyler how to use a tampon, which I cannot imagine anyone less qualified except for maybe Edward Scissorhands to teach such a particular skill. <laughs> right. Look, I spent a lot of time around underage girls. What do you want? She is not the first or the last girl I'm ever going to teach to use a tampon. I know how to put them in. I know how to take them out. I know where to store them to make sure that they maintain their level of freshness. Wait, where's everybody going? I take them out with my teeth. That's why they look like this. <laughs> the tampons or his teeth? Both. Both. <laughs> So Liv Tyler also says, I, I learned about sex from looking at the tattoos of the guys' arms on the oil rigs. And then Liv Tyler tells Bruce Willis, I was raised by roughnecks. You can't be upset that I fell in love with a roughneck, Bruce Willis. And she never calls him daddy. That's yeah. a thing that he's like, I've told you, you should call me dad. And she's like, I'm going to call you Bruce Willis until I have to call you dad. But that'll be an act three. <laughs> But I love him. <laughs> Suddenly Affleck. <laughs> so enough of that character development. Let's head back to NASA HQ, where Billy Bob Thornton is holding court now with a bunch of military brass. Among them is General Keith David, who says, Damn it, why don't we just send up 150 nukes and blow that rock out of the sky? Billy Bob is like, now you do that at... That asteroid is just going to laugh at you and keep on coming. They're top NASA nerd. He's like, uh, that's a terrible idea. And General Keith Davis was like, was I talking to you? And then Billy Bob Thornton says, look, this is Ronald Q. Egghead. He's pretty much the smartest man on planet Earth. You might want to listen to him. That's a quote from this movie. Yeah. And then General Keith Davis says, the president's advisors are suggesting a nuclear blast could change the asteroid's trajectory through the injection of disinfectants and direct sunlight and hydrochloroquine. And then Dr. Ronald Q. Egghead, he explains why hitting the asteroid with nuclear weapons won't work by using an analogy with which the whole audience audience can identify letting a firecracker explode in your hand yeah <laughs> now you know how sometimes you're in a movie theater and you're really drunk sir and you <laughs> happen to bring in a bunch of black cats now if you just put those black cats in your palm uh -huh. and set them on fire i'm listening to you and now it'll sting yes but it's also going to make everybody in the theater laugh right of course <laughs> now on the other hand if you close your fist never done that it's too dangerous it's gonna blow your fingers off because of science see the former scenario will send you to a cvs minute clinic the latter scenario will have your wife opening ketchup bottles for the rest of your life <laughs> yeah and then billy bob makes the leap of like we're going to have to blow this thing up from the inside. So we need to find the world's best deep core drillers. And you're just like, what the fuck? Oh, all right, I guess. Cut back to the big rig where something goes wrong and oil is spraying everywhere. Bruce Willis, who it turns out is the greatest deep core oil driller. He uses his street smarts to cap the well or something. Oil's just spraying everywhere, including all over these Chinese investors. But the investors see his behavior as leadership and not some litigious situation stemming from a workplace that's rife with safety. Safety violations. And then during this exploding oil sequence, we see the whole team of named actors running around and helping out. And this includes Michael Clark Duncan and Steve Buscemi and Will Patton. At one point, Bruce Willis jumps off a ledge as a fireball explodes behind him. A la Die Hard. It's awesome. Yeah, it's a, it's a real like, remember when he was good? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> then an air force general just shows up after all that's put to rest and he's like hi i'm general air force general i'm here to take you bruce willis back to the united states on a matter of urgent national security and then steve buscemi saunters up all creepy like you know how steve buscemi naturally approaches everyone and he's like hey uh bruce willis uh look i didn't know that girl was underage which <laughs> first off steve buscemi's character not only knew that this girl was underage he paid extra to make sure she was underage a hundred percent because this isn't the only time this comes up in the movie it's not like a little throwaway joke like hey i was just making a little damn eh, having a little fun little goof repeatedly throughout this movie it's like oh no i didn't know she was underage i thought she was 18 i swear and you're just like oh 
God, this movie is so vile. And Bruce Willis is like, it's not about you, dumbass. <laughs> then uh, he says, look, if I go, Liv Tyler's got to go with me too. She's real smart. And I don't want her fucking Ben Affleck anymore. And then before he leaves, Bruce Willis tells Will Patton, I need you to get Ben Affleck off this fucking rig. They take off in in the chopper mm -hmm. and Billy Bob and Bruce Willis finally meet. They're in Houston at the Johnson Space Center. And after we get Billy Bob's introduction to Bruce Willis and Liv Tyler, General Keith David is there. And then long story short, Bruce Willis and Liv Tyler, they find out about the Texas size asteroid and they both shit their pants in fear. And during the scene, Liv Tyler reaches over under the table and grabs Bruce Willis's hand because she's really scared. And Bruce Willis glances over at her and he's like, yeah, that's my little girl. She needs her daddy when she's scared. She still loves me that's the hand that jerked off ben affleck on my o-ring she probably had one of those fingers up his asshole <laughs> and then bruce willis is like hey why are you telling us why are you like are you telling everybody on earth individually and billy bob thornton is like no uh if the news got out there'd be a breakdown in social services and religious panic basically the worst parts of the bible the worst parts of the bible yeah show me the good ones i say did you happen to see that movie deep impact that's what they did in that movie and people fucking went bonkers we do not want that in this movie okay we're going to keep this hush hush for now well and it turns out that bruce willis had made a, like as a pen on some kind of drill that they were going to use to go to mars and they've been training their astronauts to use it and they take him to look at the thing it's all fucked up they're doing it wrong and they're like we need your help bruce willis then he says look the only reason i'm any good is because i work with the best now me and my team are going to need to go into space and drill this fucking comet and get show it a new <laughs> or drill it a new asshole and Liv tyler is like um are you sure you want to go to space He's like, look, baby, I just don't trust anybody else to go to space completely unprepared. Bruce Willis asked Billy Bob Thornton, look, my team's just got a drill, not astronaut stuff like flying in space shuttles or getting out of the space shuttle or walking around on the surface of a foreign location in spacesuits or driving a moon rover or handling high tech nuclear technology. Nothing like that, right? We're just drilling. A hundred percent. Look, you have my word on it. I, if you want to get me a stack of Bibles, I will swear to you on it. Also, I will give you a buffalo nickel if you get that team here within 48 hours. By the way, what year were you born? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think they put Bruce Willis in this hilarious yellow toupee so that we, the audience, don't get him confused with Billy Bob Thornton? Because they both have these watered-down southern accents, and they're both balding in spectacular fashion. Because you swap their hair and give Bruce Willis more 5 o'clock shadow, they are indistinguishable from one another. Yeah, except one, I would argue, has more screen presence, and it's not Bruce Willis. Actually, Billy Bob Thornton's pretty good in this, because he's a good actor. Right. Not that Bruce Willis is bad. Bruce Willis just sort of smolders and emotes and squints his eyes at Ben Affleck for fucking his daughter. That's pretty much all he does. Yeah, and Billy Bob Thornton is just full of, like, country fried one-liners <laughs> about how <laughs> shit's getting bad. But then, Chad, uh, we get our first taste of Aerosmith in this movie. The first of many. <laughs> It's a cover of the Beatles come together while Bruce Willis gets on the horn to get the band back together. Because, you know, since Bruce Willis left the oil rig, Bo, what was it, two, three days ago? Everyone there's just gone buck wild stateside. Yeah, I mean, while the cat's away, Chad, Michael Clark Duncan has gotten on his motorcycle in South Dakota. Oh my God. He's being chased by no less than five police cars and a helicopter. Michael Clark Duncan is on this Harley chopper in this red, white, and blue leather vest from the Dennis Hopper Easy Rider collection. I've never been to South Dakota, but I believe in my heart of hearts that a man with the physical description of Michael Clark Duncan on a Harley like this, wearing this outfit, speeding down the country roads of South Dakota, it would most certainly end with him being greeted with a multi-tiered police escort to the state line toot sweet right the the only way you get out of that is if you have a pass that says no no i'm just going to sturgis <laughs> We then meet Ken Hudson Campbell, who we last saw after his woman was fucked by Leon Phelps, the ladies' man. Ken Hudson Campbell, he was also that dirtbag mall Santa in the original Home Alone. And he's in this movie, and I felt like he was supposed to be the Bluto Blutowski of the bunch, but it kind of turns out he's just kind of the fat guy. He's 100% just the fat guy. He's getting a tat while simultaneously asking his mother for donuts. Mm-hmm. 
And that's his whole character is just, I, I'm a fat guy that eats donuts. And then they talk, it, there's like voiceover as they're like, well, you know, there's uh, Maxi who is uh, the fat guy. There's Bear. And then they're like, and then there's Rockhound. And we call him Rockhound because he's horny. And it's Steve Buscemi. He's down in New Orleans, and he's trying to talk the panties off some underage girl. Shawnee was, Smith. She was in The Blob, and she was also on that Ted Danson Becker sitcom. Yeah, she was in the Saw movies a bunch and stuff like that. Like, she's been around for a while. and But anyway, yeah, he's putting the moves on her, and she tells him that she's been married for two weeks. He is examining her ring, and it's just like, yep, that's fake. You should probably fuck me. Wait a second. Are you 18? What side of the quinceanera are you on? Then the FBI shows up to drag him off. And that's when he's like, so uh, how old are you again? Right. And you're, and you're just like, like, he's not asking to make sure that she's legal. He's really asking to make sure that she's not legal. Because that's the only way he can get an erection. The reason that he doesn't have a computer is he every time he leaves a location, he just has to destroy whatever computer he has. Just chunk it in the ocean and move on. Yeah, because it's just chock full of nothing but pedophilia. Our next character is Owen Wilson. He's the cowboy of the bunch. And we see a bunch of helicopters coming over the horizon, chasing him on this horse ranch. It's very cinematic. Let me ask you this. What in the fuck is his character? He has like four lines in the whole movie. He's the cowboy. All right, fine. We reintroduce Will Patton, the guy who is the scooter to Bruce Willis's Kermit the Frog. And Will Patton, he's the gambler of the bunch. And he's also a deadbeat dad, and we're going to find that out later. And we see him in Las Vegas, although he never really gambles in the movie outside of his Las Vegas interaction. So that really doesn't make any sense. The one thing that would kind of make him more of a deadbeat is actually what Steve Buscemi does in a little bit, which is to get a loan from loan sharks. Right. Will Patton doesn't do that because he's too classy. There was probably <laughs> a point where they were like, here in the script, uh, it says, Will Patton, that you're just going to go make a, an outrageous deal with loan sharks. And he was like, yeah, uh, I don't think I'm going to be doing that. What's that? Huh? I'll do it. I'm already trying to fuck a 13-year-old. I'll tell you what, Steve, you just, you have a way about you. And I admire it. The fact that you were willing to put your dignity out there like that mm -hmm. I've... yeah that's what i did you see billy madison i put lipstick all over <laughs> my face i don't give a shit <laughs> call me chet right the world needs more steve buscemi's we don't need more bruce willis's or brad pitt's we need more modern day peter lorries we don't need more humphrey bogarts although he wasn't that handsome so we've assembled our crew all except for Liv tyler saying but bruce willis who's gonna run the other rig he says, well, I guess it's going to be the one person that I hate the most. It's my surrogate son, Ben Affleck. He goes and finds Ben Affleck, and he's at this new location that has signs up all over the place with Ben Affleck's name on him, president of oil drilling company dude it's been three days you started your own company i thought about this maybe this was a company that belonged to his father and now ben affleck senior has died and ben affleck jr came back and took over the family business but that's not what happened it's 100 percent implied that ben affleck returned stateside to start his own business got a business license bought real estate and then set up the signage and so forth all in the space of about 48 hours and bruce willis is like look uh, i need to ask you something and ben affleck gets all high and mighty about this where he's like yeah i get it you came here to apologize you know what i want to hear five words from you i want you to say i am sorry ben affleck i am a big douchebag and he's like look <laughs> i'm not gonna say any of those things and he's like well then why'd you come out here if you're not gonna apologize to me or whatever and bruce Willis is like look there is not a job on the planet i want to work with you on wink what does that mean what does that mean hey where you going i thought you need me to work for you and bruce willis just takes off and like if you play Play this scene out. Bruce Willis turns his back and starts walking away. And Ben Affleck chases after him. He's like, hey, come on. Come on, Bruce Willis. We cut away because, again, no no single cut in this movie is more than five seconds long. But if you imagine what happened, like, Bruce Willis goes where? Does he get to his car? Before he's like, eh, I'm just fucking with you. No, we need your help for this NASA thing. I think he goes to his car and gets a shotgun and shoots him in the leg again. <laughs> <laughs> that's for fucking my daughter man so all these miscreants show up at nasa we have the decency at least not to go through the whole spiel of what's happening instead we cut to them like all stunned at the table we have the muscle the cowboy the gambler the sex addict 
uh, who likes underage girls. We got the fat guy. We got the dude who's fucking Liv Tyler. And Bo, there's some other dude at the table in a black leather jacket yeah. that they don't ever really talk about. No, the, the only time he matters is right here when they introduce him again. You're like, who is this? And then, then later when he dies. He's less important than Ernie Hudson in Ghostbusters. Oh, a million percent. Because at least Ernie Hudson crosses the streams and helps defeat Gozer the Gozerian. This guy just sh- hangs out in the shuttle until it's time for him to get killed by a rock. So Steve Buscemi has his one-liner here where he's like, eh, eh, beam me up, Scotty. And you're like, all of this is just the worst. Billy Bob Thornton is discussing these new recruits with General Keith David, who describes them as a bunch of retards that he wouldn't trust with a potato gun now look i know that the use of the word retard is not acceptable in today's society but i want to tease this out a bit is he calling them retards and then separately saying he wouldn't trust them with a potato gun or are these two thoughts combined in one where he's saying mentally handicapped individuals that i would not trust with a potato gun because i know a lot of people in my day-to-day life that i wouldn't trust with a potato gun starting with you and me bo yeah i I mean i agree with that but no i think it's him putting some ink English on the slur where it's like first of all they're idiots second of all they are so stupid i wouldn't trust them with a non-lethal uh potato gun bro you give me a potato gun i'm gonna put an eye out like a uh, like a spud i get it it's a potato joke yeah <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Willis comes over and says, the team's going to do the job, but uh, they've got some requests that are meant to be comedic relief. And Owen Wilson wants parking tickets taken care of. And that nameless guy in the black jacket, uh, he's got two women. He wants made American citizens, no questions asked. And at, at this point, that guy like rubs his hands and licks his lips like he's a wolf in a cartoon or something. Yeah. And then the fat guy wants eight track tapes to be brought back. Will Patton, the degenerate gambler, he just wants an emperor's package at Caesar's Palace. They ask about who killed Kennedy. Michael Clark Duncan wants to stay in the Lincoln bedroom for an entire summer. That's that's the part of that that I like where it's like, look, I'm not just staying overnight. I'm going to make myself comfortable. You know, in the year 1998, there was a better chance of Michael Clark Duncan spending the summer in the White House than Morgan Freeman actually getting elected president. Yeah, that's true. Good thing America's in a post-racist world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I hear. Billy Bob is like, I think we can probably, you know, arrange some of that. And Bruce Willis says, oh yeah. Also, none of us ever want to pay taxes again, ever. We got a bunch of libertarians on our hands here, Bo. Right. Again, this is a real, hey, we love America, except for all the stuff that actually happens in America. When did you first see this movie? Back in 1998 or years later? It wasn't in the theater. It had to be whenever it was on home video. I'm building up to something, Bo, because I've got for you a quiz. A quiz titled Back in 1998, where I'm going to give you trivia questions from the year 1998. And you have got to be able to give me the answer. If you answer enough of these questions quickly, you will win a big prize from the year 1998. Are you ready, Bo? Of course I am. All right, here we go. Back in 1998, this famous search engine that's not being was founded in Milo Park, California. Yahoo? Google. Back in 1998, Noel Godin, a Belgian anarchist, smacked a cream pie in the face of what famous Microsoft founder and current conspiracy theory public enemy number one for his plan to track all humans through the COVID-19 vaccine? (laughs) Bill Gates. Correct. In 1998, what version of the Windows operating system was released? Was it Windows 98? Correct. Okay. Back in 1998, which of the following was not a top baby name? Emily, Hannah, Jacob, Topher, or Adolf Sandusky? Uh, Adolf Sandusky. Correct. Back in 1998, what other man shared the title of Time Magazine's Men of the Year along with Kenneth Starr? Hint, he was the recipient of the most famous extramarital blowjob in American history. Uh, Bill Clinton. Correct. Back in 1998, what was banned in all California restaurants? Smoking. Correct. Back in 1998, the Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan was fined for burning a cross in his garden and infringing air regulations in what state? Georgia. California. Bo, that California, they don't like smoke in any form. Back in 1998, what company introduced the advertising slogan, Think Different? Uh, IBM? Apple Computers. Okay. Back in 1998, what company introduced the advertising slogan, Think Outside the Bun? Taco Bell. Correct. Back in 1998, what locally owned pizza restaurant introduced the advertising slogan, If You Don't Like Fast Mike's Pizza, 
fuck if we care. Fast Mike. Correct. Back in 1998, what locally owned pizza restaurant closed permanently due to customer complaints about its newly introduced advertising slogan? Fast Mike's. Correct. Back in 1998, what Wham front man was arrested for engaging in a lewd act in a public restroom in Beverly Hills, California? George Michael. Correct. In 1998, what do you think the lewd act George Michael was arrested for? Performing and or receiving a blowjob. Correct. In 1998, Carmen Electra partook of a nine-day marriage to the BFF of Kim Jong-un. Who was this famous basketball player? Professional wrestler Dennis Rodman. Correct. Back in 1998, this former Disney Mouseketeer released her debut single, Baby One More Time, years before marrying Kevin Federline, shaving her head, beating up a car with an umbrella, and open mouth kissing Madonna on the VMAs live on TV. Future home gym arsonist Britney Spears. Correct. Back in 1998, this famous crooner died at the age of 82 and currently is the suspected baby daddy to the Vanity Fair investigative reporter Rowan Farrow. Frank Sinatra. Correct. Back in 1998, this famous singer and California politician was killed after crashing into a tree while snow skiing at a somewhat ironically named Heavenly Ski Resort. Uh, pass. Sonny Bono. Oh. In 1998, what SNL performer died at the age of 49 after his wife, high on cocaine, shot him between the eyes, in the neck, and in the chest? Oh, Phil Hartman, R.I.P. Back in 1998, this low-cost airline was founded, proving that Southwest isn't the only cheap airline you can fly without fearing for your life. Uh, Virgin? Jet Blue. Oh. Back in 1998, this former professional wrestler and co-star of Predator was elected governor of Minnesota. Oh, Jesse Ventura. Correct. Back in 1998, what vapor distilled water was introduced, proving that not only are people stupid enough to spend $2 on a plastic bottle of water, but they'll pay $3 if you put the word smart in the product's name. Smart water? Correct. Back in 1998, this movie was presented the Oscar, having come out the year before, showing a naked breast, garnering it a PG-13 rating. Titanic? Correct. Back in 1998, the top five scripted TV shows were all on NBC. How many can you name? Zero. ER, Friends, Frasier, Veronica's Closet, and Jesse? All right, moving on. <laughs> I was correct, though, because I couldn't name zero of those. We're almost done here. Back in 1998, Mark McGuire hit 70 home runs, but later admitted that he used what performance-enhancing types of drugs to hit all of those dingers? Steroids. Correct. Back in 1998, the space shuttle Discovery blasted off with this 77-year-old legendary astronaut, making him the oldest person in space after having originally claimed the title as the first American to orbit the Earth in 1962. John Glenn. Correct. And lastly, back in 1998, what aging rock band had the 23rd most popular song according to Billboard's Top 100 falling ahead of Body Bumpin' by public announcement and just behind Everybody, a.k.a. Backstreet's Back by the Backstreet Boys, thanks in part to the aging rock band song being prominently featured in the Michael Bay summer blockbuster Armageddon. Aerosmith. Correct. Bo, yes. you scored enough points to win yourself a teal iMac that no longer turns on. <laughs> oh, you know that I feel like I've got one of those already. <laughs> the garage has a lot of uh, nooks and crannies. So back in our movie, we see our ragtag group of goofballs and they're getting medical, physical and psychological exams to see if they're able to take this trip into outer space. And all of this is accompanied by Curtis Mayfield's pusher man to really jazz things up a bit. Yeah, we've got Ellen Cleghorn, Saturday Night Live's Ellen Cleghorn, with a giant silver dildo. Sticking it up Bushimi's ass and... Threatens Will Patton with it. He's like, I don't think you're going to be taking that route with me. And then a doctor tells Michael Clark Duncan that his bad cholesterol is really bad, so he just takes off all his clothes and dances. <laughs> he's wearing this striped underwear, and he screams, Pork Ryan's this! And he just does this sexy dance. He pulls down his pants and shows off his ass cheeks. It's something. And then Udo Kier... From 2001 is the <laughs> psychologist. Uh -huh. Michael Clark Duncan cries when he is being examined. Bashimi reveals himself to be a genius with multiple doctorates in geology and chemistry. I like for the audience that he solves a Rubik's Cube really fast. <laughs> yeah. And you know that for the people that really got the firecracker in the hand analogy, they're just like, dang, he is smart. You see how fast he did that? And then, and, and when he's being shown the war check <laughs> he's just like those are boobs those are you with boobs those are me with boobs those are my face on boobs those are definitely underage boobs i'll keep that one thank you <laughs> Affleck just sees Bruce Willis being disappointed in him. Will Patton has the best moment here where he's just like, look, I just don't like his room. 
uh, how about you get those those pictures out of my face? No, I, I'm going to be fine in space, but I don't like this room is what I said. And then he just flips over the table and goes at Udo Kier, which is pretty funny. None of this matters because they all fail their tests, but they get approved anyway. Right. There's a big clunk approved. And then we get a right stuff moment with all of these ding dongs walking in slow motion, shoulder to shoulder. Here we meet William Fickner and he's going to be the captain of one of the two. Yes, I said two new and improved space shuttles that are gonna go up to save the day and but remember just a few days earlier new york city was devastated by an attack of volkswagens and basketballs also another space shuttle exploded in the sky earlier that morning so the nation has really got to be in a state of total shock and they have no idea that this texas size asteroid is on its way that's right but we do have two x-71s which are super cool they're named independence and freedom oh I kind of felt like Anheuser-Busch backed out on the sponsorship opportunity to have them called Budweiser and Michelob. This movie just never misses an opportunity to be as dumb as it can possibly be. Hey, how about a training montage? Oh, yeah, please. Naming those shuttles the Freedom and Independence, it's the <laughs> cinematic equivalent of that press conference where Trump, like, hugged a flag and almost mm-hmm. made out with it. Yeah. Where you're just like, God, this is gross. And then one of the NASA pilots, Chad, is also a hot lady. So let's just keep that in mind for a little bit of horribleness <laughs> later in the movie. That female commander, she tells him that, hey, you're going to be in these new suits that won't make you bounce around like Neil Armstrong because, hey, this movie's not paying for that level of special effects when you get on this asteroid you're gonna walk around like it's on earth you're not gonna bebop all over the place we don't have those kind of dollars or that kind of time to shoot while sweet emotion plays check two for the aerosmith jukebox there they introduce a big truck called the armadillo that is the sort of the drill truck (laughs) and immediately these dumbasses start looking through this truck and they're like well this is all wrong let's start tearing this shit apart and making it like we want it to there and all the nasa guys are like no we all that stuff is there for a reason that keeps you alive they're like fuck you poindexter what's this an ice cream scoop cost 450 dollars get this shit out of here because in this movie Bo, the blue collar regular joes are the smart people the scientists who have all the phds they're dumbasses right forget any measure of expertise (laughs) Billy Bob at no point gives him the Keith David dressing down of like, you're going to want to listen to him. He's pretty much the smartest person here. Instead, he's just like, you know what? These sons of bitches, (laughs) they've got pluck. And as long as they got pluck and a can-do spirit, then who cares what physics says? During this scene, Owen Wilson does his Owen Wilson thing. And he says, uh, oh, hey, look, we're going to be like real heroes. This is truly an amazing moment in the history of our lives. This is monumental. We need to embrace this. I'm the cowboy. Owen Wilson had only done Bottle Rocket and bit parts in The Cable Guy, and he was in Anaconda, which, by the way, Bo, how has Anaconda not shown up on this show thus far? Give it time, Lowenstein. It'll get there. They take them all up on fighter jets. Yeah, they, I'm going to throw up. The, the fat guy does throw up. Then when we get back on the ground, we have another Owen Wilson moment. This is lines three and four of, of Owen Wilson in this oh, movie. Hey. We have, he's just like, oh, yeah. Um, look, uh, this is like Star Wars. Uh, you know, I'm, I think I'm like the Han Solo. And he's talking to Ben Affleck and he's like, hey, forget about it. I'm the Han Solo over here. You like Chewbacca. And he's like, oh, hey, oh, hey. I mean, what? Did you even watch Star Wars? I'm not Chewie. Come on. Time check, Bo. We're six days till Asteroid Impact. And a fucking hour into this movie and fucking <laughs> nothing has happened. We cut to everybody in a conference room and there's this large globe and beside it is a moon. And it's here that Billy Bob Thornton does his best dot. Brown and he explains the ending of our movie to the team of ding dongs and also us the audience and he's like so look two shuttles are going to blast off and they're going to dock with a Russian space station to get fuel then they're going to slingshot around the moon land on the asteroid and there's two sites at the softest parts of the asteroid and Owen Wilson chimes in for his fourth line and he says oh hey when we get to the asteroid what's the atmosphere going to be like when we land and Billy Bob Thornton says did you see that remake of Fantastic 
Fantastic Four in 2015, it's going to be just like that. Razor rocks, unexpected eruptions, death all around. He's like, oh, oh, hey, just, you know, you could have said the scariest environment imaginable. That's all you had to say, just scariest environment imaginable. I get it, man. And then, so here's where we introduce the ticking clock of the movie, which is you have to blow this comet up or this asteroid up before it hits the <laughs> zero barrier, mm -hmm. which I think is what you pass through to get to that other world in the Fantastic Four. Right. They have to be going 88 miles per hour. And you have to drill down 800 feet and then do a gigawatt of electricity <laughs> and then it'll blow. The whole idea is that you're blowing the Texas size hunk of rock in twain and each one is going to just miss the earth, which spoilers is what happens. But we have a clock ticking regarding the impact of the asteroid hitting earth but then there's also a physical barrier that creates a deadline that the asteroid cannot pass this line in outer space or else everyone else on earth is gonna die it's a ticking clock for a ticking clock and let's not forget there will be a later ticking clock in between the ticking clocks but yeah there's like three or four that that get rolling it's oh, a geez. real inception type thing you got to pay attention, Bo. <laughs> yeah, it's a real smart movie. You ever held a firecracker in your hand? So Bruce Willis is like, where's my sexy daughter? And they're like, oh, hey, I think he's with, uh, <laughs> I think he's with Ben Affleck. I mean, no, somebody else. <laughs> And Bruce Willis goes and finds Liv Tyler and Ben Affleck making out in, in an engine or something. He doesn't interrupt them. He just kind of watches them and jerks off. <laughs> and during the scene, Ben Affleck proposes to Liv Tyler and slips a ring on her finger. And she's like, oh my God, we're getting married. And then Bruce Willis goes back to Steve Buscemi and Michael Clark Duncan and is bitching about all this. Buscemi says, look, Bruce Willis, Liv Tyler, she's not a little girl anymore. And I should know. I don't get aroused around her when she's nearby, all right? My dick is as soft as can be. Look, she's a full-grown hottie. I'm not going to say that she's not hot, all right? That's somebody else's type, but it's not mine. I like him young, like Epstein young. Yeah, it's so weird. As soon as she turned 18 years of age, I had no interest in her whatsoever. Bruce Willis says, I just didn't want my daughter to marry a roughneck. She's better than that. And they're like, no, no, she's really not. I don't know if you've sat down and talked with her, but she's kind of a ding-dong. Owen Wilson chimes in. Oh, hey, Liv Tyler, she's a young woman. She's curious about her body and she's exploring her sexuality and it's it's a natural thing oh hey so needless to say bruce willis he doesn't hear want to hear about how all of these degenerates are thinking about his daughter's sexuality because clearly all of these guys at one point or another threw out an invitation to see if she'd rsvp to a little behind the scenes hanky panky yeah. and then michael clark duncan he steps in as the voice of reason and he says you know bruce willis we all helped raise her we're all kind of her daddy. And then we get more montage where Ben Affleck shows off that he's a bit of a wild card. We also hear that they're going to have eight hours to drill 800 feet. And then at this point, we cut over to this underwater simulation that is supposed to help them react to weightlessness in space. The whole idea, they're giving them like a little bit of the Kobayashi Maru, where it's like, hey, we're going to put them in this pool and have them test drill and then throw some variables at them. Right, a little curveball. Right, and Ben Affleck is like, hey, everybody shut up. I know how to drill watch this <laughs> and as he's doing it bruce willis is like hey ben affleck quit fucking up in there you need to back off you're gonna blow the transmission he's like hey how about you go fuck yourself i'm the one handling the drill in here you need to trust me for once and then of course it blows the simulated transmission bruce willis like tracks ben affleck down after he comes out of the pool or whatever and is like hey when we get up there are you gonna fuck everything up for us and he's like no i got it and he's like i want to hear three words out of you i've got it and he's like okay i got it bruce willis is like look i know me and my team of knuckleheads have been fucking up left and right but how about we take a night off before we go to space and really tie one on because there's nothing Nothing better than a bunch of blue collar knuckleheads piloting spaceships than being hung over when they do it. This whole scene where he demands that they get the night off is shot with a gigantic American flag behind Bruce Willis and the music swells and it all ends with Bruce Willis saying, I'm not asking you, Billy Bob Thornton. I'm telling you, give my boys the night off. Steve Buscemi takes the opportunity to take a $100,000 loan from a loan shark. Mm -hmm. While Bob Seger sings, roll me away. Yeah, of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> then we we have the i guess one of the most famous scenes of the movie where it's ben affleck and Liv tyler making out with him like doing animal cracker shenanigans on her bare stomach do you like ben affleck in anything because i don't yeah 
What is he good in? I think he's good in Argo. Dude, that's a whole movie where Hollywood blows itself and jerks itself off at the same time of how Hollywood can make a difference in the world. I dislike that movie. In fact, the only part of that movie that I like was the ending, which when I did a little research on it, they made all that shit up. None of that happened. You know, he's fine in Goodwill Hunting. Um, I'm a bit of a Phantoms apologist. Boy, you're stretching. I also think when it comes to that Justice League movie, I think he's one of the better things about it. Did you listen to our episode on that? He's horrible. Hey, look, that, that whole movie is wall-to-wall shit. Like, Zack Snyder is right next door to Peter Berg and Michael Bay in my book. Would you give Ben Affleck a potato gun? Sure. I wouldn't. Ben Affleck and Liv Tyler, they're canoodling around, and he's sticking animal crackers in her panties, and they're having this conversation of animal crackers or cookies or crack. It, it's just, it's really, really D-list stand-up comedy. And then Liv Tyler says, hey, Ben Affleck, do you think anybody on Earth is doing the same thing we're doing at this exact moment? No, Liv Tyler, no one's doing this. But Ben Affleck says, you know, I hope so, babe. If not, then what am I going up into space for? Well, I like to call it the sky. We cut to Will Patton, oh, yeah. who is this degenerate gambler. And he wanders up to this modest house where this woman in a sundress comes out. And she says, you can't be here. I got a restraining order on you, Will Patton. And then this three-year-old kid pops out and says, who's that man? And the woman says, this ain't nothing but a trifling salesman. He ain't worth shit. Get back in that house before I whoop you. Yeah. And then the kid goes inside and Will Patton says, I know you're probably going to call 911 when I leave, but I got something big coming up. Something real big. And I want you to give that kid there who's... Name I plum forgot just now. How embarrassing. But anyway, give him this toy space shuttle that I picked up at the 7-Eleven around the corner when I was buying a fistful of lottery tickets. I'm sure it'll mean something to little what's-his-name in the future. What he says, Shad, is I'm about to go do something that, you know, might make you both proud of me. <laughs> and when he says that, the first thing she ought to think is, he's about to blow up a fucking building. Like, he's about to commit an act of domestic terrorism. <laughs> this no-good degenerate gambler is about to do something that is going to, quote, make his life meaningful. That is bound <laughs> to result in the deaths of dozens of innocent people. I did think about what went through her head when he said that. My most logical conclusion was that he was going to fake his own death <laughs> and that they would come into a pretty sizable amount of money yeah i think that's best case scenario i really think the him driving a van of manure into a government building is probably <laughs> higher on the list but he's gonna shoot up his mouth with a novocaine pull out all of his own teeth stick him inside of a corpse and then blow up another federal building <laughs> that's the plan i got myself a, a little compound just outside of town and me and some other boys who really believe in liberty <laughs> are gonna take back part of the country that <laughs> <laughs> let, let me just say that he's gonna know my name but yeah so more aerosmith plays while we cut to a strip club where the rest of our drilling crew is getting lap dances led by steve buscemi you know he had to be upset because it got to be 18 to strip he's disappointed but he's trying to make it work he's got a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> in cash and he's just tossing it around because in his mind they're all gonna die so why not go out in style and style for this character is at a shitty strip club and a biker comes over and asks like hey how come you guys are hogging all the ass because we got a hundred thousand dollars shithead steve buscemi just throws some money in his face is like hey how about you go fuck yourself then it breaks out into an inevitable fight which leads to the team getting arrested but nothing comes of this nothing. arrest though it's not like bruce willis has to break him out and like gives him a speech about how they need to straighten up and fly right or billy bob has to do that it just doesn't matter no we're cutting back to nasa hq and apparently the three percent of the sky that they've been monitoring with their one million dollar budget they find that there's another big big chunk of space rock headed over towards asia and it's about to kill a bunch of people sadly these people are children or the elderly this rock comes in and crashes into who knows where no it's in shanghai they they later say and oh, okay. the best part about this is they get a message saying like it's gonna hit in the south pacific and somebody is like hey billy bob thornton should we warn anyone and he's like What's the point? Like, why why even try to save lives here? What are we going to do? Alert the whole South Pacific? Fucking yes. Yes. You tell everybody you can. <laughs> so after this Asian version of what we saw in New York City, we cut back to NASA HQ. And here we see that Billy Bob Thornton has braces on his legs like the young Forrest Gump did. And Billy Bob Thornton tells Bruce Willis, I always wanted to be an astronaut and get a flat patch like my heroes. Have you ever let anybody down Bruce Willis? And Bruce Willis says, I never quit yet. And he's like, all right, well, don't fuck this up. Yeah. 
I mean, that's the whole scene. It's just like, you know, hey, would you give me a sentimental gesture later at the end of this movie? And Bruce Willis is like, yeah, I can do that. Then we see some news reports talking about how this mission is underway because the word is out about this giant comet or whatever. It's an asteroid. The comet was in Deep Impact. This is the asteroid. You got to keep that straight. Whatever. And then... <laughs> <laughs> we had to get in his face center in florida and now suddenly everybody on planet earth knows that there's this global killer event happening right and so we start act three of our movie is it because yeah because there's an awful lot of movie for this to be act three no 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 no. this is a, a, act one as they get him on board two they train him and then here we're going to shoot him up into space because bruce willis at this point finds his daughter she's hanging out somewhere all by herself on a launch pad and Liv tyler says i really need to apologize to you i love my life and i don't blame you for my mother leaving she left both of us but mostly you but i love you and promise me you're gonna come back just promise me no matter what happens you're gonna come back alive and you won't sacrifice yourself for anybody else to save their life yeah, and then she adds and by the way if it's not too much trouble bring my husband back her fiance then they cut to a plaque for uh -huh. the apollo one astronauts who died horribly mm -hmm. and it's like just get that name right out your mouth armageddon you can show your American flag, but trading on the deaths of honest to goodness American heroes is one of those bridges too far for me where I'm watching this movie. I'm like, this is gross. <laughs> this movie is just gross. <laughs> We then see our movies cast headed towards their respective spaceships. In slow motion, like slow motion putting on <laughs> helmets and shit. And, and they put, better yet, Chad, when they're putting on their suits, like they don't put their actual names on the suits. Like Steve Buscemi mm -hmm. says Rockhound because that's his nickname because <laughs> he's a horny and he likes to fuck little girls right but you're just like what the fuck like nobody would ever do that. nobody would be like so what do you want on your name patch i mean obviously we're not going to put your name so what is it that people called you in i don't know eighth grade oh booger all right booger <laughs> all right what about you all right chimichanga what about you bear all right what about you oh marble balls okay we got it all everybody be sure you bring back marble Marble Ball's dog tags if he gets hurt up there. <laughs> just so The whole scene is punctuated with this uncomfortable acapella version of Leaving on a Jet Plane as sung by Ben Affleck. And Liv Tyler, she just hoists herself up in the air and wraps her legs around his waist as a final goodbye. And then Michael Clark Duncan sings bass and Steve Buscemi comes in as kind of the accompanying chorus. And then the fat guy in the movie, he's bebopping. They're all singing as they head to their space shuttles. And then we get this montage of everybody getting buckled up. And we hear the president of the United States start to make this inspiring speech. And the president says, I address you tonight very strongly and powerfully, not as the president of the United States, but as the citizens of humanity. The Bible calls this day Armageddon, but I call it U.S. Armageddon, registered trademark. <laughs> Everything that can be done has been done. We've shut off traffic from China. We're firing inspector generals every Friday afternoon like clockwork. All of this space science that we've learned is mostly true, but I'm hearing part of it might not be true. And that's what they're telling me. And we're at war with this asteroid, although we can't see it. It's there. It's the invisible killer. During this whole speech, the movie shows us shots of small town USA with farms and barber shops and people across the country just actively listening to the president of the United States go on and on about how the efforts of an entire planet, but mostly the United States, is going to save humanity. Yeah, it's all this golden light, Norman Rockwell, American <laughs> flags painted on the side of old brick buildings <laughs> where you can still buy a malted. Oh, it's just the worst. <laughs> and then we have a moment where like they're going, uh, the astronauts and drillers are going up this platform to get into the <laughs> independence and the freedom. <laughs> before they get in, Ben Affleck stops Bruce Willis before they part ways. Bruce Willis is like, hey look i guess you know i just want to tell you that and ben affleck is immediately like hey you don't have to say a word harry i know i think we're we're good like that also i'm gonna try not to disappoint you harry and then they share like a laugh over that over the fact that ben affleck has been a constant source of disappointment to him and then they get strapped in and then owen wilson is like oh hey before uh we take off i gotta i gotta say i'm like 98 percent excited and two percent scared 
or or, or maybe it's two percent scared and ninety eight percent excited. It's it's all real confused, and that's kind of what makes it hot. During this montage, we also see Will Patton's kid. He's laying on the floor watching TV. He's like three, and he's like, "Mom, that salesman is on TV." And then the mom comes in, and her jaw hits the floor, and she's like, "Baby, that ain't no salesman. That there's your daddy." She's like, "Oh, thank God he didn't blow up a building." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's your father. You can learn his name now. He's he's an American hero. With all the back taxes I owe, the last thing I need is a federal investigation and asking me questions i don't need some g-men sniffing around our finances kid <laughs> as the shuttles take off chad both of them up into space there is a shot of Liv tyler against an american flag it's awesome that is one of those fuck this movie so hard moments for me where I'm like i get it we just saw an entire montage full of american flags now we got to throw one more in my life has afforded me the opportunity to see multiple space shuttle launches and i gotta tell you man it is pretty breathtaking when you see it i'm sure it is but i don't need every single shot of this movie to be america fuck yeah i know that has become cliche that song is seemingly directly inspired by movies like this where it is yeah. just wrapping itself in the american flag as a cheap sentimental gesture it doesn't mean anything I saw the last space shuttle nighttime launch off the east coast of Florida when it happened. And I was out there with my wife and my very young son and about, I don't know, I mean, there must have been a thousand people around. And when it launched up into the night sky, it's totally black. No one says a word. And you watch the shuttle go up and you could just quietly hear the rocket boosters going. And then off in the distance, one guy broke the silence when he said, man, that fucker's really up there, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's the majesty of this movie. <laughs> Of, of somebody, a, a shirtless hillbilly, <laughs> breaking the awe-inspired silence of seeing, like, like, here's the thing, we didn't talk about this earlier, but there's a point where Billy Bob Thornton is like, people have been wondering what the fuck NASA is for for 30 years, let's show them what we're made of. It's that kind of stuff where I'm like, just go fuck yourself, like, I, you don't have to justify the spirit of space <laughs> adventure, and by the way, nobody who is a NASA astronaut in this movie is worth a shit no again it's all the blue collar stuff of like it doesn't matter that you're a nasa astronaut that you worked all your life to train and to be the best so that you could break free of the bounds of mother earth no why would you do that bo you can just show up a week and a half earlier, take some sort of technical school short form examination, and fucking do the same job. Right. It, it, it's that kind of America, attitude. America, <laughs> fuck yeah. yeah. It, and that is the Showing attitude throughout this movie. Showing up to send a motherfucking movie. day. And so Billy Bob then reminds him like, hey, remember when I said you were going to dock with that Russian space station? Uh, you're about to do that. Peter Stormare has been alone up there for about 18 months. Uh, Peter Stormare, who is, by the way, not Russian, he's going to be crazy as whale shit when you get up there two years earlier we saw steve buscemi get put in a wood chipper by this guy in fargo man talk about your better movies this movie is so bloated and this whole russian cosmonaut shit should have been 100 percent edited out of this film it does nothing but add 30 minutes of its run yeah like we are finally going into space an hour and 10 minutes into this fucking movie let's just skip the whole russian space station segment it doesn't matter all you need to know is that the russian is a bit wonky in the the head he's a stereotypical russian in a movie made in the united states he's got the floppy ear flap hat and he's got the whole moose and squirrel accent and they dock they refuel the space station blows up they almost leave ben affleck and the russian but they somehow make their way back to their shuttle and then we're headed off to go save planet Earth. great and then a reporter tells us the shuttles are about to slingshot around their moon and uh -huh. billy bob thornton is like all right everybody it's time to start praying we're about to send these boys up to about nine Jeez. how many of you all saw apollo 13 because what you're about to see is a miniature version of that <laughs> everybody on the space shuttle screams and then they're okay it's like the first two-thirds of a roller coaster ride and then they get used to it and they're like oh this is kind of fun the two shuttles make their way behind this asteroid and there's all this debris flying around it looks like the millennium falcon when it was in 
the asteroid field and the camera's all shaky. And then the Independence, I think it's the Independence. Maybe it's the Michelob. It gets hit. It's the one with Ben yeah, Affleck it's in the it. The Independence is the one that gets downed here. It crashes, but it crashes on the asteroid. Not so bad that any of our movie's marquee stars get hurt. The best part of this scene is that when the Independence is getting pelted with asteroid rocks, the front windshield of this shuttle gets ripped out. And then the pressure sucks the two pilots just out into space. Two dummies are just yanked out of these chairs. It's like that woman in Nightmare on Elm Street who gets yanked through the front door window. Yes, it is a <laughs> an equivalent <laughs> effect. As the Freedom is like, what the fuck just happened to that other space shuttle? One of the, the pilots uh, of the Independence just bangs oh off the windshield. It's like that cop car in the chase. Again, you throw a corpse at a window, I'm at least perking up. Then the Independence <laughs> crashes on the comet and everybody at Mission Control is real bummed, including Liv Tyler, who now thinks that Ben Affleck is dead. Right. And then the Freedom overshoots their landing field, according to Fickner, but they land anyway. That's Team Bruce Willis. And then Steve Buscemi yeah. is like, hey, what happened to the Independence? They're like, look, they're all fucking dead, man. Just let's all, we'll tip one out to them later, but we got a job to do. Bruce Willis, when they land, he prays a little prey for the death of everyone on the on the Independence. <laughs> yeah. And then, dear God, Jesus and baby Jesus, please be with the souls of everyone on the Independence, including cowboy and bear and that russian and maybe that guy in the black jacket who is at the table whose name i don't know just amen worth pointing out here owen wilson just fucking dead and never mentioned again till the end of the movie oh hey thanks for inviting me to the movie for about 40 minutes no it was a lot of fun my character's dead but you know i, I gotta go it's been engaging talking to you guys learning about you you know i learned that bear's not his real name you know turns out i got a part in a new wes anderson movie i play a calliope salesman i think it's gonna be a real hit <laughs> then Liv tyler at mission control uh billy bob thornton is like hey Liv tyler you should probably leave and she's <laughs> she goes i got nowhere else to go <laughs> You put all the people I've ever known and loved on those spaceships. So here I am, Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> and then Billy Bob Thornton says, uh, I meant you shouldn't be here next to me because I had about a dozen boiled eggs for lunch and I've been eking about some wicked air biscuits. And I'm just offering up a personal courtesy because the stench is unbearable even to me, Billy Bob Thornton. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and she's like oh it smells like somewhere that's green <laughs> um i will fit as many little shop of horror jokes as i can into this steve buscemi remember the smart one who likes to fuck underage girls he points out that their landing location is on an iron plate making their drill job more difficult and impacting their ability to communicate with the planet earth yeah we come back to the other crash site where team ben affleck there are some people that are still alive that includes the russian he's still mm -hmm. alive ben affleck is alive and michael clark Duncan are right. alive. Oscar, question mark, is dead, as well as Owen Wilson and whoever the pilots were because they got sucked out into space. <laughs> Tim back at Team Bruce Willis. They've rolled their Rambler out and they start drilling. The gear shift to make the Rambler move has this glowing red skull on it. They both do. They they didn't just put it on <laughs> one where the fat guy was like, you know what I like? I like glowing eye skulls. It was like, you ever see the Terminator? <laughs> this, this comes like as the part of the standard package on the armadillos, apparently. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's standard. I think they got the upgrade. And I think that that upgrade also included that Gatlin gun that they strapped to the front of these things. Right. So the Freedom team is starts drilling. They blow a drill head. And Bruce Willis is like, well, we got to unpack another one. Let's get, we got work to do. And then we cut back over to Ben Affleck. Team Affleck, they get in their ramble. Right. And he just <laughs> shoots this chain gun mm -hmm. that's attached to the front of this thing to blow holes through the side of the space shuttle. And they, they Swiss cheese that motherfucker, man and blast out of it oh my god then we cut back over to the freedom team who not only have blown one of their drill bits now they've blown their transmission and he says that they've blown a tranny which is code for giving a transvestite oral sex <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's five dollars and then bruce willis he prays to god he says he's like dear god make me a bird so i can fly far far away and help me drill a hole in this big asteroid the size of texas amen <laughs> dear god whose name i do not know thank you for this drill i forgot how deep 
And then at Mission Control, they determine that because of going around the moon or going near the moon, Mm -hmm. that this asteroid is now tumbling on three axes. And they're like, wait, it was just tumbling on two before. We're fucked. Because now we only have communications with our team for seven minutes. And we can only detonate the nuclear bomb remotely for five more, which is our our backup plan. If they can't get this thing drilled, we're just going to blow the nuclear weapon up wherever it happens to be. So we got three clocks ticking here. We've got the first clock when the asteroid's going to hit Earth. We got the second clock where they can't go past this particular mark in space. Right. And then we got this third clock where people on Earth have to decide whether or not they're going to blow up the nuclear weapon remotely from NASA HQ. And if only, Chad, there were 12 minutes left in this movie. There, Oh my God, there's like an hour <laughs> left. We're going to get through it pretty quick. But, so Ben Affleck and his crew, it turns out, are following the source of some beep uh, in their armadillo. Yep. And then back at the Freedom. Uh, Team Bruce Willis. Right. Bruce Willis goes inside the ship to get a new transmission and he reveals to William Fickner that they've only dug 57 feet so far and William Fickner is like, oh, we are so fucked. All right, hey, I, I gotta get on the horn and call uh, the Earth. Why would he do that? Just let these people do their thing. If shit goes sideways, Earth is fucked either way. Right. Just let them do their best and figure shit out. If not, better luck next time. Oh, wait, never mind. There's a whole, yeah, there's a whole Mexican standoff here where Fickner pulls a gun on Bruce Willis and he's like I gotta report this to my superiors and they're getting in a tussle then they lose the radio signal and Billy Bob Thornton back in Mission Control is like we gotta get that radio back up we can't let them blow up that nuclear weapon then we cut over the president and he's being told that he's only got five minutes to decide on remotely detonating the nuke i'm gonna leave that decision up to the governors of each state and the guidelines of the cdc the central detonation council then i'm immediately going to criticize every governor's decision and say what they did was wrong and then i'm going to burn those guidelines out in the rose garden we got to open up churches they're essential businesses because without churches where do people pray nowhere it is literally impossible to pray anywhere but inside of a church also, this may seem like pandering to my base. I don't really have a follow-up. Just pretend that it's not pandering. By the way, what did that black president in Deep Impact do? He was a loser. He never made strong, forceful decisions to detonate a bomb in space. You know what? I'm going to detonate this bomb in space and because it's the opposite of whatever the black guy did. Let's nuke this asteroid. I know we're supposed to unveil the painting of Morgan Freeman from Deep Impact, but we're not going to do that because my administration, first of all, knows no depths to our pettiness. Second of all, knows no depths to, uh, to uh, asteroids. If any of this goes sideways, um, none of it's my fault. We're all going to blame Cuomo. (laughs) <laughs> and then we're told this is the secondary protocol uh-huh. and billy bob thornton is like wait a second we only got one chance to save this planet let me let me talk to the president and he says look mr president if you blow up this bomb you're gonna kill everybody and then he looks at keith david and kind of smugly he's like he wants to talk to you and, <laughs> and then he gives the phone back to keith david and keith david is like mm-hmm. uh-huh all right okay I got you. And hangs up the phone. He's like, we're going to blow it up in 30 seconds. And Billy Bob's like, God damn it. I really thought I had him. <laughs> Liv Tyler screams like, you're killing my father. Missing, by the way, the big picture by a mile. It's not just, hey, we're killing your old man. This is going to result in the death of everyone and everything. We cut back to the ship where the countdown, a, another timer has started on this bomb because it's ticking down now. Uh-huh. And and Will Patton is like, hey, wait a second. I think that uh, is bomb here seems to be counting down anybody know why that is they try to get the guys outside uh who are still drilling back on the shuttle and then bashimi just starts laughing which is the first sign of the space crazies that he gets yeah he gets what ren hoek calls space (laughs) madness yeah meanwhile back down on earth billy bob thornton quietly tells one of his flunkies he's like hey man stop that uplink and (laughs) and then his flunky does while the bomb is stopped we get the face off with will Patton and bruce willis and fickner and one of the other astronauts and when the bomb shuts off bruce willis just knocks (laughs) william fickner in the face with this big pipe wrench Uh uh-huh will Patton elbows the other astronaut right will Patton gets the gun and then while all this is happening up on the freedom down on earth billy bob thornton's flunky gets found out and they're like we need you to leave this station he's like all right and then as soon as he (laughs) leaves the bomb starts counting down again and bruce willis has to sweet talk william fickner who by the way he has just brained in the skull with a wrench and then 
collared him like one of the U-Bonds from Planet of the Apes. Yep. And then is like, you need to turn this bomb off. You know we can do this. And for no good reason, William Fingner is like, you know what? I'm going to disobey that direct order from the president, and I'm going to go with you, Bruce Willis. Right. And then we get this 35-second bomb disarmament <laughs> that they just pop off the top. They zip, zop, zoop, and it ends with the cliche, should I cut the red wire or blue wire? Red or blue? Blue. No, wait, red. And then they cut red and the bomb stops. And then the radio is back up now when Mission Control also sees like, hey, the bomb stopped for no good reason. It's Bruce Willis who's giving him a jingle this time. What's he say, Bo? Houston, you have a problem. Oh, right. I think I blocked <laughs> that out. <laughs> and... <laughs> and then Bruce Willis says, now, I don't know if you know this, but I promise my daughter, Liv Tyler, who has spent the last hour of this movie on the verge of tears, that I would be coming back to Earth no matter what. And under no circumstances would I ever sacrifice my life or the life of another person to ensure that she has a life of happiness and fulfillment with someone else where she could build a life and start a family. I would never save anyone else's life to allow her to do that, even if they've stuck animal crackers in her panties. I'm coming home. I don't know what you people are doing down there, but we got a new tranny up here and we're looking to drill her like she's never been drilled before. Long and hard and fast. Everybody's like, hooray for America. Hooray for trannies. Billy Bob Thornton and his whole team start cheering for these complete dum-dums who have gone rogue on the asteroid. It's awesome. Then we cut over to Ben Affleck. Mm, Team Affleck and their rambler. Who get stuck at the side of this big canyon on the asteroid. And they're like, well, what are we going to do? And Ben Affleck is like, God damn it, and throws a rock and sees it just float off into space. That's how things work in space. There's not as much gravity as there is on Earth. Right, he's like... I got an idea that's just crazy enough to work. But he actually says, have you ever heard of evil can evil? I think sweet emotion starts playing again or something. It might as well. And then <laughs> we have a brief cutaway to Steve Buscemi riding this nuclear bomb like slim pickings. Uh-huh. Going all space crazy some more. And they're like, get off the fucking bomb. And he gets off and then just starts yelling, no nukes, no nukes. Because the best way you can portray <laughs> insanity in a movie is to have someone who's either, I don't know, piloting a Greenpeace vessel or mocking the <laughs> anti-nuclear movement. We come back to team affleck and they're in their rambler and they just blast their thrusters and fly across this grand canyon sized chasm on the asteroid and the rambler it jumps over this open space the same way that that bus did in speed like there's no ramp but somehow they just zoom up into the air and i was like well this is pretty stupid but then the rambler goes up into the air and it kind of like comes across some other asteroid rocks and then it ricochets up into space and everybody in the rambler is like whoa this might be a problem i mean we might be in trouble the situation's not looking good if you know what i mean dude if i'm in this rambler and i'm floating off gently into space i'm shitting buckets of diarrhea and screaming uncontrollable instead they've got poor peter stormari to climb outside he's like i have an idea and he climbs outside moose and squirrel i'll get out of the rambler and see what is happening they're trying to fire thrusters to push him back down and it turns out those are all iced up and he uses a de-ice Long story short, he gets it working and they get back on the ground. Back with Team Bruce Willis, Steve Buscemi, he's full on space bonkers. And he goes over and grabs this remote control that connects to the Gatling gun on the front of their Rambler. And he just starts firing live ammunition (laughs) at planet Earth. Yeah. And then just starts blowing the shit out of everything. And William Fickner is like, hey... I think that guy has space madness. Then the ground just starts cracking because they hit a gas pocket or something. Right, and it blows up, and then the fat guy in the movie, he gets blasted into space, as does the Rambler. Yeah, and so... R.I.P. fat guy. Yeah, who, by the way, is just... He doesn't explode or anything. He just drifts off to die alone and (laughs) theoretically just, what, dehydrate? I guess. I don't know. I mean, what a horrible way to go. (laughs) And then, and nobody is like, we got to get him back. It's just like, see ya. Even Steve Buscemi, to the point, is like, see ya, Max. Let's go back to planet Earth, specifically Americana, where we see people in overalls rushing into bomb shelters, and New York City is all abandoned, and we see a couple of mosques that are full of people that are all going to go to hell because they haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. And then a breakaway piece of the asteroid hurdles towards Earth, and Paris is annihilated. Yes. It blows the 
shit out of Paris. Earth is fucked. It is never going to be the same again. Paris looks like a landfill after this chunk of rock hits it. Half of like the Arc de Triomphe is left, but you clearly see the Eiffel Tower just devastated along with Notre Dame as this nuclear weapon style shockwave just devastates the city. I think that's some of that shit that they added before the movie was released. Right. Just we got to have more stuff blow up real good. Possibly. I felt like the opening sequence with New York City was added after the fact. Just blow shit up. Right. And then Liv Tyler back at Mission Control just grabs Billy Bob Thornton by the throat and is like, just do something. He's like, what do you want me to do? And she's like, I don't know something. Then we cut back to (laughs) Steve Buscemi, who is just completely embraced the idea of oblivion at this point. Yeah, we got a front row ticket to the end of the earth. (laughs) Yeah. And then over the rise comes the other armadillo. Hey, it's me. Ben Affleck, I'm in the Rambler. You ever heard of Evil Knievel? Just immediately, they start drilling again. They're like, great, we, we're America! Fuck yeah! Coming again to save the motherfucking day! So they they duct tape Steve Buscemi to a chair Uh because he's got the space madness. And then we also get the piece of information that there are no more transmissions or drill heads. We just got one shot at this, everybody. Good news, we only need 60 seconds, Bo, because it's 785 feet, 795 feet, 802 feet, Bo. We're done. We drilled the hole. Yeah, so they start pulling all the pipes out that they use for this drill or whatever. Uh Uh-huh. And then one of them's bent, so they have to send Ben Affleck in there to get the crooked-ass pipe out of there. Yeah, they sent a guy down in the hole in Deep Impact, too. I don't remember that part of it, but it's been a while. As as they're trying to get that out of there, gas pocket blows or something, and it shoots Ben Affleck comically out of it. Yeah. And Will Patton grabs the hose he's attached to at the last second. Is that who does it? I thought it was Bruce Willis. Oh, it is Bruce Willis. You're right. I just want everything to be Will Patton. (laughs) (laughs) because <laughs> he's my favorite thing about this shit starts blowing up all over the place like there are these gas pockets that are blowing out of the asteroid left and right and then ben affleck after he's been saved by will Patton or bruce willis he screams out we lost gruber gruber's dead and i was like who is gruber and he was one of the other astronauts i think <sighs> And then Bruce Willis says, I don't think this comet likes us very much. And Will Patton. It's an asteroid. It's not a comet, Bo. You're mixing up the movies. Come on now. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And then Will Patton says, that's because it knows we're here to kill it. Which is both the dumbest line of this movie and maybe the only one I can tolerate because I like personifying this asteroid somehow. The next problem on our hand, because this movie is never, ever not without another problem for our heroes to deal with. The trigger on the nuclear bomb is not working and it has to be manually detonated, Bo. So our team of misfits, they just decide to take time out of their lackadaisical, easy breezy schedule to draw straws to determine which one of them will stay behind to detonate the bomb. And Bo, it turns out that Ben Affleck has drawn on the short straw to detonate the bomb yeah and he says you know everybody's got to die but not everybody gets to die saving the world you know and they're like all right bruce Willis is like just get in your suit i'm gonna walk you down you dumb dumb they take the elevator down and ben affleck tells bruce willis hey i want you to tell <laughs> hey be sure you tell grace like i'm always gonna be with her and whatnot why doesn't he say tell her i love her <sighs> He's afraid of commitment, but one of the nine writers on this movie was like, what if he just says he'll be with her and not I love you? Bruce Willis grabs Ben Affleck's air hose and he rips it out of his spacesuit. And then Bruce Willis rips the mission patch off of his own suit. He sticks it in Ben Affleck's spacesuit pocket because they have pockets. He pushes Ben Affleck back into the elevator chamber and he says, make sure Billy Bob Thornton gets that patch and hits the up button. And so Ben Affleck is going back inside the ship and it will be Bruce Willis who's stays to detonate the bomb but not before bruce willis says bye son oh my god i know it's that is another one of those like oh go fuck yourself you take care of my little girl i always thought of you as my son i'm I'm damn proud of you you go marry Liv tyler and you my surrogate son and my real daughter just having sex and making inbred babies it's a dream come true running around with potato guns (laughs) shooting them off and sensitive to contemporary views of genetic mutations go live your life boy have a bunch of close-eyed kids and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> big eared melon headed monstrosities and anyway so they take Liv tyler now to a bunch of max headroom tvs uh-huh that are just filled with bruce willis faces which is horrifying yeah. you know it's him well you know I, I i guess i'm gonna have to break that promise that i was gonna come home but i'm sending ben affleck back to you i know that's a, a poor substitute but you know uh <laughs> 
And Liv, Liv Tyler says, I lied to you too, Daddy. I said I didn't want to be like you, but I want to be just like you. Except for the part where you're going to be blown up by a nuclear bomb in about two minutes. That part sounds terrible. Suddenly Bruce Willis <laughs> is blowing up an asteroid. Bruce Willis says, Ben Affleck saved us. And Will Patton, I couldn't have done this without him. And I wish I could be there to walk you down the aisle, Liv Tyler. And I'm going to come and I'm going to, I'm going to look on in on you. From time to time, I gotta go, Liv Tyler. And then Liv Tyler says, No, Daddy! No! And look, man, unless you're a monster on watching this movie the first time, you're wiping a tear from your eyes. She says goodbye to her daddy as he sacrifices his life to save her fiancé and the rest of planet Earth. I guess I'm just the world's biggest monster. This is all just stupid. <laughs> this does not work on me on an emotional level at all. This I'm is so all surprised garbage. by that because you're such a soft touch. I just think that your hatred of Michael Bay somehow creates an immunity to prevent you from feeling any sense of human connection. To be manipulated by the shallowest possible cinematic tricks? Yeah, I well, guess no. so. I expect well, at least a, a modicum of genuine emotion because none of this feels real. None of it's earned. It, it's just shit that happens on a screen it doesn't it doesn't mean anything but that's the essence of life so the shuttle surprise surprise won't take off right away and so the one female you may have forgotten chad there's an actual female astronaut on, on this yeah she threatened to kick michael clark duncan in the dick is he on the space shuttle still is he yes still alive? he's still alive okay good for him the female astronaut is like i'll, I'll go fix the space shuttle and uh -huh. she runs downstairs and peter stormari is like no nah, she is a woman she will never fix it and then he runs after her mm -hmm. and literally shoves her out of the way at a certain point Yep. So that he can bang on the ship with a, a wrench. Does it work? And then it just starts working again. Because space shuttles, presidential elections, is there anything America has made that the Russians can't fix, Bo? Apparently not. It's, it's another of those moments of just like, why on earth would somebody technically proficient at this be allowed to perform their job? Like, it is, it, it sums up this movie so well. Why craft anything when you can just hit it with a wrench? Eventually, the space shuttle blasts off our asteroid, and our remaining crew gets away safely. Bruce Willis is on the asteroid. He detonates the nuclear bomb with some extended suspense. We're not going to go into it too much, because it's just kind of like, the whole thing is like cake with icing and syrup and chocolate sauce on top and then whipped cream and sprinkles and a cherry and let's put some sparklers You're like i don't need more of this right yeah the, the secret to the eight layer michael bay dip nine layers <laughs> Bruce Willis hits the button on the nuclear bomb and then we see this rapid fire montage of Bruce Willis and Liv Tyler's life intermixed with her as a child uh, going through her adulthood he thinks about what she would look like you know as a bride before the moment of his death the asteroid explodes the world rejoices but mostly America as the two halves of this giant rock the size of Texas head 400 miles on either side of the planet and everybody is okie dokie this montage is so fucking dumb with like box cars with nasa written on the oh side God. it's so and awesome. kids running with shuttles in front of american flags it is just again it's just gross there's a brick wall with john f kennedy painted oh. on it and the words peace life and hope in small town usa they're like a bunch of kids running around outside of a mercantile store like <laughs> <laughs> oh god i hate it so much chad i hate this all so much and the music swells and very quickly our heroes just land back on earth in their space shuttle at the kennedy space center and they're greeted with a hero's welcome and Liv tyler rushes out to greet ben affleck with her signature move of jumping in the air and wrapping her legs around his crotch and then will Patton looks up and he sees his ex-wife slash estranged wife and she's there with her kid little what's his name yeah, who's wearing an american flag shirt chad just in case you missed any of the subtle references to the us of a they picked that up at walmart on their way to the space center and this kid hugs will Patton because you know will Patton's no longer a sleazy door-to-door -door salesman but rather an unreliable father with a serious gambling problem that deserves respect until he doesn't again and then um the captain of the space shuttle he comes over to Liv tyler and he says permission to shake the hand of the bravest man i ever met 
Yeah, the closest I've ever come to that is bumping chess with the second cousin of a guy I thought had nice hair. <laughs> Steve Buscemi, he's greeted by one of the strippers from the club where they were arrested, which, how did she get access to the Kennedy Space Center? Her name, by the way, according to Steve Buscemi, is Molly Mounds. Does she really think she has a chance with Buscemi in this movie? This old hag looks to be 19 or 20 years old. <laughs> right. No, thank you, madam. This yeah. snagglepuss prefers them a little less ripe, if you know what I mean. Looking for a greener banana. Beat it, Grandma. <laughs> Billy Bob Thornton shows up and Ben Affleck says, uh, yo, uh, Bruce Willis wanted you to have this flight patch. He ripped it off his sleeve before he gave his life to save her. And then, you know, Billy Bob Thornton takes it. And he's like, man, I finally got my patch. And then the Blue Angels or the Thunderbirds or somebody flies overhead. How there aren't fireworks exploding in the background is still a mystery to me, Bo. And then because this movie doesn't know how to end. So we get the freeze frame of Ben Affleck and Liv Tyler smooching. Right. Only to to fade out and then come back up on their wedding yeah during the credits uh, i mean can we just end this already and it's a bunch of sepia home video of them at the chapel and like molly mounds catches the bouquet <laughs> it's just the worst she and hands it finally, to her daughter and steve buscemi walks over and puts a ring on her finger and she's like eight hey, hey hey Liv tyler tell me when you guys have a kid and if it's a daughter then I'm interested. <laughs> um, so, and then that's it. Then finally we fade to black and the nation's nightmare is over. And by the nation, you mean you. Yes. I mean, my, my national nightmare is finished. And I, and as the credits rolled, the first thought I had was, God, I'm never watching that again. I could see you going the rest of your life and never watching this again. Absolutely not. No, there's no way, like we've done it for this show. I will never do it for any of the other podcasts I do because that's not the kind of shows I do. And I will never, I mean, watching this for pleasure, the only way I could see that happening is I, if I ever like have one of them car accidents that makes pleasure pain and pain pleasure so that. That I have to like put a nail through my dick and watch Armageddon to feel joy anymore. So as we have made a tradition, we always rank our movies from best to worst, worst to best, however the hell you want to do it. So, Bo, how would you rank the six movies in season 11? We're all going to die from top to bottom or bottom to top. Do you have a ranking? Do you need a moment? Nah, I can do this. I You may be unsurprised to find that Armageddon is the worst movie of the season for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. I would put War of the Worlds at five, Terminator Dark Fate at four, Outbreak at three, Happening at two, and Kingdom of the Spiders at one. We are such different people. <laughs> My bottom, you may be surprised, it's not Kingdom of the Spiders. My bottom is Outbreak. I don't think I'll ever watch watch outbreak again above outbreak at my number five is kingdom of the spider okay fair enough above that is war of the worlds then the happening terminator dark fate and armageddon is my number one <laughs> you know i i go back to what i mentioned earlier of, of that idea of armageddon being somebody slipping a trash can on top of you and banging it for two and a half hours and that's what it's like for me watching this movie it's just the worst possible noise and i just hate these kind of movies i hate the, the that kind of uber nationalist jingoist overly masculine willingly stupid films <laughs> uh, like Armageddon is genuinely I think one of the worst movies I've ever seen and Michael Bay <laughs> is easily my least favorite working director I, I think he should not be allowed to make movies and as one season ends yes another season begins yes it does and we have poised for season 12 a very interesting sextet of films would you care to introduce the theme and your choice as the leadoff movie for season 12 oh would i the next season is going to be called as seen on tv they are adaptations of very popular television programs and we are going to be leading off with the sean connery villain turn in the avengers no no not the good one chad <laughs> <laughs> not the one with the hulk and whatnot you're talking about the one that no one's ever heard of and most people haven't seen yes based on a, a somewhat obscure british based television series starring diana rigg the avengers stars ray fines and uma thurman yep. both at one would argue the height of their careers and also features a rare turn from uh, eddie azar not surprisingly i've never seen this movie you know, I barely remember it coming out. Let me tell you what you're going to like about The Avengers more than you're going to like about uh, The Armageddon. 97 minute runtime. Nice. Yeah. 
<laughs> so it might suck, but it's going to suck for a whole lot less time. Excellent. I want to thank everybody for uh, joining us for this particular episode, for this particular season. As always, like, rate, review, recommend us to a friend. Send us an email at picksixmovies at gmail.com. Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Michael Bay's cinematic masterpiece, Armageddon? No, I never want to think about it again. But uh, let me say that we got a little bit of pushback on uh, Terminator Dark Fate. A number of people who were like, you know, I thought that movie was okay. Mm-hmm. And, they were wrong. And to which I would say, did you listen to the show? <laughs> and hopefully that level of discourse can be maintained into season 12. Doubtful. <laughs> <laughs>